Hey, I'm Dan Cox. I'm a senior 3D artist at Blizzard Entertainment, and today we're going to start learning how to use Blender in a really quick, fast, and easy method using the industry-compatible shortcuts. Bang! There we are. So I've got a basic default setup here for Blender. Um, if the user interface is a little bit hard to see, we'll, we'll scale that up. The first thing that you're going to be presented with if you start loading up Blender for the first time is going to be this screen right here. And we can actually ignore most of it because all that we need to access can be accessed later. But if you get this screen and you've got it available, well, we can change our shortcuts here to industry compatible and leave it like that. Uh, now we could go with di different kind of color values and all that stuff, but it doesn't matter. I can just start with this and start working. Now, if, however, you are starting with Blender uh, and you've clicked away from this screen and you can't find it again, it is hard to find, you can just go to Edit, go to Preferences. Now we can pop into Input, uh, or rather uh, Key Maps, and uh, you'll be able to change your settings right in here. So Blender is the default shortcut settings, and these ones are difficult for a lot of people to learn, I find. But people coming from other pieces of software, such as 3D Studio Max or Maya, or any, uh, even Photoshop, <laughs> for most other uh, setups, you can use something like Industry Compatible, and a lot more of the key bindings might be something that you might be more used to and uh, expecting. Now, there's a few more things that I want to look at in here, and that is, first off, my interface. Uh, for one, I've got a pretty high-resolution monitor here. Uh, I'm just going to scale up my interface to 0.18. This is actually a lot more manageable to work with. I'm going to move my little camera port over here, and we can see a, a much easier to work with setup here. Uh, this is going to be more viewable for you, but I wanted to show that this kind of thing you can actually do uh, in real time. It's pretty cool. Uh, but that's got it set up for me. Uh, there's one more thing that you're going to want to do for this uh, tutorial that we're going to do. We're going to make a hydrant. And what you want is to look for image as planes. So our add-ons area right here is where we can turn on and off different types of add-ons inside of Blender. And there's a lot of really, really useful uh, tools that you can use in here. Uh, there's another one we can use called Extra, uh, extra Objects. Uh, this is a fun one to turn on. Um, you can just keep it on. These are all automatically installed with default Blender, uh, but you can turn on whether you want them or not. Uh, and By just clicking this on, we've activated it. So again, extra objects and image as planes uh, are both two uh, useful tools for us to start with. And we can just close this up and we've got our default setup here now. So we are currently using the industry compatible shortcuts and uh, a couple of extra add-ons now, how do we navigate inside of the Blender user interface? Well, we've got our key sort of viewport right in the center here. And to move around it, I can hold Alt and middle mouse click uh, to sort of pan around the scene and left click and drag to rotate around the camera and uh, right click to zoom in and out. So I just hold that and zoom in and out. Uh, I can also use the mouse wheel on my uh, mouse if I want to, uh, to do that as well. So that's, again, uh, holding Alt for pretty much everything. Middle mouse to pan, left click and drag to rotate, right click and drag to zoom in and out. Next, I can click on objects with just standard left click. I can start to move things if I want by pressing W. So that's one of these shortcut keys I can use. I can also access any of these immediate functions via my little uh, selection over here. So I can use Move with W, I can use Rotate with E, and I can use Scale with R. So this is standard for most other pieces of software, and it works just fine here. So I've got my gizmo in the center of my object. I can move along specific axes by just clicking and dragging on that gizmo. I can move along two axes at once by clicking this square, and I can switch which axis that is by sort of selecting the appropriate different axes. And if I select on this centerpiece, I'm moving within my screen space. Uh, so wherever my screen uh, is rotated to, I'm moving sort of uh, perpendicular to that space. And if I use middle mouse click as well, I can also do that same function as the inside. This is one of the fast ways that I use uh, for working inside of Blender, is I, I actually often just use the middle mouse, and I don't often click these axes by themselves. 
Now I can repeat all these functions again for rotate. Again, I can pick any single individual axis, or I can use my middle mouse to rotate the same way as this centerpiece does. And again, that's all screen-based in this case. Now I can do the same thing with scale. Again, middle mouse will scale just uniformly across the whole object. I can also use X, Z, or Y in all of these cases. Now, uh, just so you're aware too, by default, uh, the Z axis is up and down. Actually, let's just go to move. It'll be a bit more obvious this way. I can use the Z axis, which goes up and down, the Y axis, which is gonna move sort of in this direction, and X, which is gonna move in this direction. So both of those are planar towards each other. I'm not saying front or back or left or right in this case, because that's just not how 3D works uh, per se, uh, unless you've got a plan for which direction is left and which direction is right. It's, it's kind of just this direction or otherwise. Now, there's one more thing that we can do, and this is what a lot of uh, Blender fans talk about, especially people that are using the default setup, is it's really easy to move around and grab things and all that stuff when you can just, in this case, middle mouse drag or move around and press X or Y or Z. And what that's going to do is each time I press one of those keys, it's locking my movement to one of those core axes. This is really, really handy because it means that you don't actually have to select any of the individual gizmos. So you don't have to move your mouse from where you are. I can like have this all the way over to the side, start moving it like this, and then still lock it to the Z axis, which is often really handy. Now, if I want to hold Shift Z, I will actually lock this to the Z axis um, plane. So basically I'm making sure that now it is not going to move up and down, it's only going to move on the plane that it exists on. The same thing is going to happen if I hold uh, Shift X, I'm going to be moving uh, basically on everything except the X axis. Same for Shift Y, I'm moving on everything but the Y axis. This is handy because now I'm moving on two axes in all of these cases. So again, middle mouse, and then whatever kind of axis that I want to move on, Shift X, Shift Y, just Y. Uh, the same thing is going to work for any rotations. So I can hold Z and I'm going to rotate just on this axis and I can sort of spin around my object to do some spinning movements. Same thing is going to happen for Y and Z and the same thing is going to happen for like Shift X, Shift Y and all that stuff. I can move on two axes at once. It's less useful for rotation. Same thing is going to happen for scale, but I think you kind of get the idea at this point. So. That is how some of the main default sort of interface works. Uh, now there's one more thing that we can do here, which is start to add in uh, how we move vertices. And how we easily get to that stuff is by going up into edit mode, which can quickly get us into uh, switching between these modes. I can so pop into edit mode, and then I can actually select each thing that I want. So vertices, edges, faces, I can select those things, move them around as I want, which is easy, standard kind of stuff uh, for most other pieces of software. However, to speed some of this process up, I can press 1, 2, and 3, and that will switch between each different piece. So, for example, edges is 2, faces is 3, and vertices is 1. You can also see that uh, represented when we just mouse over certain sections. Generally speaking, it will show you what the shortcut key is for that. It is, however, not in this case. But you can see if I press 4, right here, I will pop back into object mode. So I can be in edit mode by pressing 1, 2, or 3, or object mode by jumping into 4. So object mode is where I'm moving my objects, edit mode is where I'm moving the parts inside of an object. Now this can also be across multiple objects. So if I right click for example, I get a number of options that I can use that change what my object is doing. These are all context sensitive as well, so if I'm using a different type of object, such as curves or meshes or lights, the options here will be different. So I can duplicate this object, which will automatically sort of attach the object to my cursor and I can kind of move it around. And my options actually are the same here. I can press Z, X, or Y to move things around. Uh, I just click and now I've duplicated it. If I click both of these objects and jump into edit mode, I can change both of these objects at the same time or separately. And I can do whatever I want as if sort of they were one object. When I press four, then, you know, they are in object mode again, and I can move around and do whatever I want. 
Now, if I press Q, I can go between different selection modes. So if I wanted to select objects differently, I can press Q or hold down on this piece here, this icon, and I can see all sorts of different selection modes. So I can get my select lasso, for example, which is one of my favorite selection modes. And you can see that I'm selecting multiple things as I just sort of click and drag around in a lasso, or I can use my drag box, uh, which are two sort of standard things. If I press Q multiple times, I do cycle through my options. The same thing will happen for any of the options here that are cyclable, such as scale. Scale happens to, if I press it again, R, I will scale to uh, my other selection, a sort of scale mode, which is uh, this bounding box type method. I basically never use this one. Uh, this one just works fine for me, plus the keyboard shortcuts. So generally speaking, your hands kind of get locked into just one little section of your keyboard, about right here, and spend most of their time in that space. It's one of the reasons why I really like the industry standard keyboard shortcut setup, is my hand doesn't have to fly around the keyboard quite as much, uh, and it can stay pretty stationary, except when I have to move on the Y axis, which is not my favorite. Um, so I try not to, uh, because it's just a little bit more work, and I'd like to move as fast as I can usually. Uh, but that is some of the main things that you can work with. So most of it is WER and 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, and, and so on. So if we just keep going up the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 setup, you'll see that we can also start going into sculpt mode for text paint mode, weight paint, and texture paint mode. So for example, if I go into 5, well, I can start you know painting and, and sculpting. This is not a great mesh for sculpting on because it's cube. We'd need more polygons. but Technically, you can do it. Uh, there's all sorts of shortcuts in here, but we're probably really not going to be doing anything with this kind of stuff in this tutorial, but it's there. Uh, next, I can go into weight paint mode with, uh, with seven. Uh, with six specifically, I can start vert painting. So if I pick a dark value, you should be able to see me painting pretty quickly on this right away. Uh, if you're in a different view mode, you may not see this. So you've got to be in this view mode to be able to see what I'm seeing at this uh, moment. But again, that's uh, vertex painting if I pick the color. I can go into weight painting. Weight painting is a specific setup that we can start dealing with a little bit later potentially, um, but it allows you to paint weights. This is similar to sort of what you'd want to be doing with skinning an object. Uh, and texture painting, uh, we don't have any textures associated with this right now, but if we had them, we could texture paint on this right now. Um, we don't have any layers or anything associated with it, but this mode uh, does work pretty decently when you want to paint. But main things we're going to be dealing with is our object mode. Now, this is sort of the, the main kinds of things that we're going to be working with inside of Blender. We've got our viewport here. We've got different sort of viewport options available to us up here. None of this stuff is inaccessible otherwise. You don't actually need any of these tabs, but they do allow you to pop into sort of different editing styles that you may want to jump into and structure your uh, viewport in a way that is more usable for what you're trying to do. So for example, if I really want to edit shaders, I can look at everything that I need with a nice looking viewport and with uh, all my shader set up right here and it's just kind of organized in a way that's going to work more appropriately for that. Or I can go into the modeling viewport which may have things set up in a way that is more uh, context appropriate for that, which is pretty much nearly identical to the layout. Uh, same thing for sculpting. It just kind of has different settings associated with each one, but all of this is accessible via this basic default interface. If you wanted to open up any of those kinds of things, for example, you can open up this tab here, this little button, and change your viewport to being something else. So for example, let's just pull this little piece down here up. So this is my timeline. But, for example, if I wanted to switch this into being usable as my, uh, what would be here, shader editor, as we saw previously, I can just click that, and now I've converted this window into being my shader viewport. And again, if I wanted this to be just another viewport, I could also do that. So I have two viewports going on in here at once. If I wanted to change or remove or add windows, I can just make sure my mouse comes right in between these windows, and I can just click and drag, and I split a window into multiple parts. If I want to get rid of that, I can just click and drag back into one of these windows, and it gets rid of it. Same if I drag this down, I get rid of it. That's just left click and drag, up to split, down to break. 
uh, to sort of merge back together again. So it's a really easy way to start pulling these pieces out. Now if I wanted to, I could also hold shift, and I thought it was shift. It is not. So that's fun. Can't remember what it is. But there is a way that you can uh, duplicate these windows and sort of have it pop out, but we really don't need to use that in this case. I'm just going to pull this back down and close it back up. So that is our default setup here for how we can use Blender. Uh, if you want to start viewing different types of uh, sort of viewport settings, we can pop up here into our view settings, which is just right up here. Uh, we can check our object type visibility, which allows us to hide different types of things, such as meshes, or you can see over here, this is a camera object. I can just hide that or I can make it unselectable by clicking the selection part. These icons generally always relate to uh, what type of operation it is, in this case, visibility or selectionability. Next, we've got this section up here, which is for viewport gizmos. I almost never deal with it, uh, but in theory, you could hide or make it so that you can't see certain things. Again, I just really never deal with this. Um, you can also change a number of our viewport overlays, such as the scale of our grid, uh, which in this case calls it a floor. And we can change the way our axes are shown. Uh, we can show statistics in our viewport and uh, all types of origins. Origins in this case are pivot points. I'll come back to that again later. We can show our wireframe in this way. Face orientation, which allows us to see back faces more appropriately. Uh, motion tracking, which I never use. And we can also uh, turn on X-ray mode which a shortcut for that is Alt-X, uh, which is one that I use a lot. Uh, next, we can change into our wireframe mode or our solid mode. So this is the default visibility setting uh, that you get when you load up Blender. Uh, and it works really well in a lot of cases. Now, if you want to change the settings of any of these sections in here, well, all you need to do is click this little drop down and you can change the way that our viewport shading works if we're in solid mode or the other modes. So let's start with solid. I could change to matte cap settings or I could click this piece to change what that matte cap looks like. So matte caps are basically trying to represent all of our geometry as sort of a more uh, detailed shading method. So this can kind of look like red clay or look like normal maps or just look like this sort of shiny surface. Uh, we can also change what kind of colors are represented here. I'm going to go with uh, some of our default uh, blending modes here. Uh, I can go with something like object or random, which will apply a random color to each object. So you can see these are all random colors. I could have textures, which again, if I had a texture applied to this, you'd see that. I could show vertex colors. Uh, now, this is also very usable if I'm viewing uh, flat lighting. But uh, we could go random, we could go single, which allows me to just change the color of everything if I wanted to. Uh, generally speaking, what I use is either material, texture, or random. Uh, those are, for the most part, the main kind of settings that I'm using at any given time. I can change my background colors. I could turn off uh, back face culling, or turn it on in this case, so that when I delete a piece of geometry, uh, let's just delete this one, you'll see that now I can't see through that geometry because a back face is being rendered as non-existing. It's culling that back face. So if I turn that on and off, you'll see that that goes away. I could turn on X-ray, uh, the same as this button right there. But in this case, I can also control how strong or how weak that X-ray is. I could turn on shadows if I wanted them. Cavity is handy for when you're sculpting. Depth of field, uh, I almost never see the result of it. I haven't played with it much, but I just really never use it. Outline uh, is there as well and specular light. Now again, depth of field settings we can actually get with other sorts of viewport settings. I don't really need it here. Next, we've got our uh, sort of material preview mode. So this mode is really handy. I use this one a lot when I'm modeling. This allows you to see more complex material setups, but still in real time. And I can turn on scene lights. In this case, I do have one light in the scene. Uh, by default, what I'm seeing is an HDRI map. So this is a cube map that creates lighting for my scene based on a spherical representation of a scene. So bright spots, light areas, as if they're real light sources. It's a naturalized way of representing lighting, used very frequently in games. And in this case, I can just sort of swap between them, see what I'm working with. I can rotate it by just sort of 
clicking and dragging. I can lower or intensify its strength. And I can also actually have it show up in my viewport, which I often like to do. It gives me a good sense of where my lighting is coming from. And I could blur or sharpen the result of that. I can also view different types of render passes in here, such as seeing where my normal maps are, or what they're looking like, what my normal pass would be. But I don't really need to do that in this case. Lastly, this final piece is sort of a final render mode, so or render preview rather, which is going to be showing me what my actual render would be like if I was using the EV style rendering or the cycles style rendering. EV, let's just pop over here into my world settings, my render settings. Let's just pull my tab over here a little bit, move my pretty little picture of myself. And we can see that we've got two types of main rendering modes. Uh, one is cycles, which is going to be a sort of real-time, not a real-time renderer, a uh, software renderer, which will do more complex rendering and uh, has a lot more associated with it, is a lot more complex. We're not going to deal with it. We're mostly going to be working in Eevee if we touch it at all. But Eevee is the real-time rendering viewport, which is just nice and quick and fast, has great looking results. Uh, I quite like the way that it looks. Um, and it should be enough for most circumstances. So now that we're over here on this side of the interface, let's talk about it a little bit. What we have here is our, uh, where is it? This one is properties. So it's one of our properties options here, which you can see. You could also, again, just if you wanted to, it's represented back here again, if you wanted to have multiple selections of this stuff, whatever, you get it. By basically using this properties area, we've got multiple sections to think about. The first section is tool. So you can see I've got the move tool selected and that's represented here. If I'm using different types of tools, such as even oops, bevel, you'll see bevel shows up over here and is the various types of options that I can use if I want to edit bevels. This is my tool setting. This will be uh, really, really usable in areas like sculpting. As soon as I have different types of sculpt modes available, that's what I'm using here. And anything that is tool related is there. Easy. So next I'm dealing with my section that exists right here, which is uh, rendering and world related. So basically anything that's going to relate to my document, some of the settings related to my renders or my world viewport settings, such as like skies and uh, that kind of stuff. And so the first one's going to be my scene, uh, scene rendering. This part is my output properties. So when I render an image, uh, this part will be for my view layer properties. Uh, this one might be a little bit confusing at first. Uh, I actually pretty much never open this up, uh, but it's going to be relate, uh, related to my view layer, which is sort of my whole scene. I don't really deal with this a whole lot because I don't do a lot of rendering, but some of that stuff's going to be there, such as passes and things like that. Next, I've got scene settings. Again, most of the stuff I don't deal with, but you can have gravity and things like that turned on in here. Lastly, we've got world settings. This is useful when it comes to viewport rendering in Eevee uh, because it helps you have an understanding of what your world like skybox background setup is. Again, most of the stuff I don't deal with. For the most part, I will jump into render properties because that can change how I'm rendering things in my scene using Eevee. I'm a game developer, so that's the stuff that I'm the most interested in. Next, we're going to be dealing with object settings. So that exists in these components down here. These icons represent that. So we're dealing with tools, world-based stuff, and object-based things, and then brush-based sort of texture stuff down here. So the first thing we're dealing with here is our object properties. That is the sort of location of our object and other things that generally relate to that, such as its relationships, its collections, its instancing. Now, if you're coming from something like uh, 3D Studio Max or Maya, this isn't the instancing that you'd be normally dealing with in there. We'll deal with this kind of instancing uh, that we are thinking about for those pieces of software later. Um, things like motion paths, how this object is sort of visible in the scene. I can make it unselectable, for example, in here. I could make it non-visible in the viewport or other areas. Modifiers is the second section here, which is one of my favorite places. We'll come back to it later. This part is particle properties for when we're dealing with particles. One of those things that's actually really easy to work with in Blender. The next part is physics properties. I have to like mouse over each one because I can never remember what the name of each thing is per se. So this is for physics. Uh, Blender is actually really quick and easy to set up uh, physics on things. 
Next, we can deal with object constraints. Well, we won't deal with it, but that's what would be here. That's where you find these settings. Uh, one of the two most important ones, again, generally when I'm dealing with things, I'm going to be popping into my modifiers. I'm going to be popping into my object data properties, which is right here, sort of mesh options, and my material settings. So those are the three spots that I pop into a lot. Modifiers, mesh properties, and my uh, material options in here. Now, these things will change based on the type of object that you're dealing with. So for example, if I click this object here, this is a light. So you'll actually see that a lot of options have disappeared from here because it's only showing me what is context appropriate for that object, basically what that object can do. And so in this case, I've got instead of mesh properties, this is my object data properties for a light, which are my light properties, basically. And I can do the same thing with my camera. This is my camera properties. You'll see there's no material options here or particle options. Oh, yeah, good. It's just physics options. I can set physics on a camera. That's fun. Not going to do that, though. But basically, that's where those things are going to exist. Object-related options, world-related options, tool-related options. Easy peasy, uh, for the most part, until it isn't. Lastly, we can deal with our section up here. So now I've got a whole bunch of objects, and this is my outliner. My outliner allows me to see all the different objects that I'm looking at and dealing with in a list. So I can shift select all of them if I wanted to. So just click one, hold shift, click the others, or I can control click each one individually and I'll select them. It's very similar to something like uh, Windows Explorer or generally, I'm pretty sure a Mac would do this as well. Now I can also select multiple objects the same way in my viewport, holding shift. I can select all these multiple objects and that will do the same thing. Now, if I wanted to deselect those objects, I hold shift on them again and I deselect it. Now you'll notice one of them selects brighter than the rest. That is called my active object. My active object is where most actions will take place. So if I am joining objects together, for example, then the object that is collected that is selected last will be the one that is uh, the pivot point, the origin point of everything else. So if this has modifiers attached to it, those modifiers get propagated onto everything else. And if other objects have a modifier, those get erased. And that is that. Now, one thing that does get annoying is if I select this object and I'm holding shift and I'm trying to deselect it, you'll notice I'm not doing it, which is pretty annoying. Because what's happening is, since this object is behind this, I'm actually just sort of shift selecting this object to being my active object. You can see the bright outline goes around it. That's pretty annoying. I'm not a fan of it. The way that you can fix this or sort of get around it is by holding shift and sort of, sel or rather holding control and dragging around something. So, for example, I am using the lasso mold, uh, mode, but I can use select box. And if I hold control and I drag and I touch the edge of this box, but nothing else, I will deselect it. So control, when used ideally with a selection drag, will get rid of something. We'll sort of take it out of the selection options. Now, if I were to make sure that nothing is behind this object, hold shift and click it, it would also get deselected. So that's just something to kind of bear in mind. Now, if I'm using the select lasso mode, this is some of those intricacies that are annoying in Blender, um, but kind of works to your benefit sometimes. What's going to happen is if I do that same kind of option here, it doesn't work. Why did it work before, though? Well, that's because select lasso uses the object's origin or pivot point to deselect the object. So what you'll see is in all my selections, I have these little dots in the center of each one and they're visible from all angles and they overlap each other. So you can see them uh, regardless of overlapping geometry. How do I get rid of them? Well, uh, or well, how do I deselect in this case is just select lasso holding control over top of those pivots and it will do the same thing. So that means that even though these objects are overlapping, I can deselect it just fine by making sure that I go over top of the pivot. The setup here again for, for this piece is just to touch any element of it at all uh, when I'm using the box mode. All right.
but that's enough of the basic interface. You understand where things are, you understand how to rotate around, you understand how to click things, how to move verts. Uh, if you're coming from another piece of software such as Max or Maya, I would really recommend that that's in some cases where you're coming from in this case because we're going to kind of step through things pretty quickly and if you don't know how 3d has ever worked before then this might feel really really intimidating uh, but i want to kind of focus on people who are trying to learn blender uh, from having known other pieces of software so the first thing i'm going to do is just delete everything i don't need anything in here i've got my default set up this makes me happy. Now, I want to add an object to my scene and I want to start creating a fire hydrant. It's a classic piece to start making as somebody learning a piece of software. It gives us some fun things to work with. So let's do that. Now, what I want to do is bring in a image as plane. So to add any object to my scene, I'm going to use my add option. So this is just right up here. I can go down into my image and image as plane. So this is a handy thing that we can use. It's the add-on that we turned on. So I'm gonna say image as planes. I'm gonna go into my videos and grab my hydrant JPEG. Now I should have uh, these assets as well available for you inside the uh, link at the description, but you'll be able to load this thing up as well. So we just click import and automatically we just get that image applied to the plane and the plane is in the proportion that that image is supposed to be in. So I can press F to zoom in and you'll see it's kind of flickering a little bit. You may be seeing this in your viewport as well. Uh, if you see nothing, for example, if you're in solid mode, that is because we need to have texture turned on. So we can keep this on. Uh, but if we're in our other view modes and you're seeing this flickering, that is because in our material settings, we just need to change how our blend mode is working. So right now, by default, for whatever reason, this got turned into alpha blend as opposed to opaque. So we just set it to opaque and it will now render as if it is an opaque surface. We can also use alpha clip if you had like sort of hard edged cuts in your opacity map for something like this. We could also turn on back face culling so that you don't see the back face for this, but we might as well keep it on. We don't need to get rid of it. So let's just move this off on the x-axis and push it up a little bit. Now, what we want to start doing is maybe starting to add in a cylinder into our scene. So we can go add and we can start to bring some stuff in here. Let's go mesh and let's go cylinder. Now we've got a big old cylinder on our scene. Now, hmm, where are my options for being able to edit this thing? Well, uh, maybe are they in tools? Nope, I'm still in the move mode. Where the hell are my options for being able to change my cylinder settings? Well, that is this little piece right here. So once I open this up, this little guy around here, all you gotta do is change the settings in here. So once I've opened this up, this will stay open forever. And now I can change the sides that I have available to me. Well, let's go with a 12 sided cylinder. Now, uh, you know what? Let's, let's go, let's go way higher. Let's go 24, 24 is nice. Uh, we can change our radius if we want to as well. We could change our depth. So that's sort of the height of our object. And we can change all these things afterwards as well, but you know, they're available to us as numbers right now, which is fun, I guess. We could change what kind of cap we've got on this object or various other types of settings here, but we don't really need any of that right now. Let's just click off of it and that sort of activates everything that's happened in there. So that's pretty good. Uh, we can start changing things as well. Uh, for example, we can jump into editing this. So I'm editing this by pressing one and I want to select sort of the base of this and lift it up. So you select this part and you move it up uh, and you'll notice this is pretty annoying. This back section here has not moved with it. The reason that it is happening is because in Blender, when I'm in solid viewport mode, it is as if I am not able to select through a mesh. This is annoying. I don't like it, but it's the way Blender works uh, as a default. And it's just the way it is. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any reason that they're going to fix it, but you'll just deal with it. The easy way to get around it is you'll press Alt and X. That's going to turn on my toggle X-ray and I can see through my mesh. If I can see through my mesh, I can select the back faces. I can press Alt X again and lift this up. So I can select everything and I could scale this down by pressing Shift X or rather Shift Z, which will just scale everything down on this axis. 
and give me something pretty manageable to work with. Now in this case I'm mostly just eyeballing things and I could change this and push it wherever I want. Now if I wanted to push this down and have it land uh, at 0, 0 in my world position then I could in theory press 0 but in here that's actually going to keep it uh, from moving at all. So what I want to do is pull this little tab over. So this little button here, this little arrow, gives me a few more options that I can work with. Now what that's going to allow me to do is to access my median transform. So this is telling me where my selection is in physical space. So I could change this single polygon to being at zero in my world space. This is really really handy to pull from because I can just always drop that object or that single single piece of mesh into that location in the world which as an environment artist uh, that is something I like to do a lot. So I've got this cylinder, not a very complicated model, but I want to start duplicating some things. So let's go into my face mode and I want some more cylinders for these sections back here. Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and duplicate that. One thing that I really like in Blender is that I can just duplicate geometry willy-nilly uh, right away. So I can right click for example and get a bunch of options here. So all of the options available here are sort of a quick access mode for duplication or extrusion or basically whatever has been decided to be default in this list. And this list is good. I, I like it for the most part. I can extrude faces, but you'll notice I actually can't duplicate faces. So that's unfortunate, but I could access things like that up here. So I can go into mesh and I can go into duplicate, which is control D. I could change things that are vert-based or edge-based, and I get a lot more options that are available here than are available on this list to the side or in this right-click list. So just bear in mind, everything that's available here is available in these options up here or in the options to the side. Uh, there isn't sort of a disconnect between them. It's just that this list would be too big if it contained everything that's available here. So, Control D is how I can duplicate this. Now, what I like to do is press X or Z to sort of lock this onto an axis and lift it where I need to, because otherwise it moves in view space with me. So, just again, Control D, Z, and drop. That's one of the easiest ways to kind of work with this. Now, I can sort of scale this up a little bit more, but I want to take this object and I want to separate it. I don't want it to be part of this mesh anymore. Uh, it's going to be annoying. I want it to have its own pivot and I want to start using some instancing. So I need to separate this. Well, one of the easiest ways is just right click, scroll on down to separate and say by selection. I could also select, uh, separate by loose parts. Uh, that will allow me to, if I have multiple pieces of geometry available on my model that are all actually separate loose meshes that aren't welded together. If I click this, they all separate into their own objects. So I can say, separate by selection. So now if I go into my object mode I have two objects available now. However the pivot point of this object is not where I want it to be. It's kind of a crummy pivot point. Basically anything that I've separated is going to maintain the pivot point of the object that it's been separated from. Which in this case is not ideal. So easiest way for me to get here is to again right click and I can go into set origin. So Blender uses the term origin, generally speaking, when it is talking about the pivot point of an object. So in this case, I'm setting the origin of my object to being, uh, let's say, origin to geometry. This is going to be one of my handiest ones. Pop. And now right away, my origin, my pivot point in this case, basically, is in the origin of my object, sort of the center point. And now I could start editing this as I need to. Well. I'll select this uh, face here by going into edit mode and I'll press control E to do extrusion. Ta-da! This button right here. I can extrude straight up or I can use my middle mouse button and press Z to sort of scale up and I got an extrusion. It's not a very complicated procedure here but it works just fine. Now I can go into my object mode again. You'll notice my pivot point is maybe not where I want it. I can just go origin again and say origin to geometry. Ta-da! I did it. Let's pull this down on our geometry here and let's start using some instancing. 
because I want each of these pieces to be the exact same, just for simplicity's sake. So to do this, I'm just going to right click and go to duplicate linked. Boop. I'm going to, instead of having this sort of fly off everywhere where I don't want it to, I could for one press zero, which is actually going to lock my movement at uh, to zero. And I could press Z, which will lock my movement to sort of zero position on the X axis, which will look like no movement at all. That may seem super, super irritating to do each time, potentially, if you don't want the object to move. And I'm not going to say it's not, but you kind of get used to it. So now I could just move this down if I wanted to, or I can right click and just say Z and get the same sort of result. Z, sort of lock it in. Now, what will happen is each of these pieces are linked. This is how instancing works inside of Blender, is when an object is linked, the object data is linked to other object data. So if I move this vertice, you'll see each one of these pieces has its vertices move, which is great. Uh, it also means that if I scale any of these objects down, they all scale down from their same origin point. Uh, all of this is great. It's exactly what I would want in most situations, and I can just sort of move these pieces up as I go. Ta-da! Perfect. Now, if you want to see whether an object is actually an instance of another object, it becomes kind of goofy. I don't see it over here like you might in something like 3D Studio Max. I have to actually look at it in my Object Data Properties area. And what you'll see is I've got my Cylinder 001, and I've got this little part here, which is showing the number of users of this data, which may sound very convoluted, because when you think of users, you might think of yourself. And you're not wrong, you are. But in this case, what it's referring to is each object here is a user of the data that is contained here, which is geometry. Now, basically, what that means is I've got four of those pieces. Now, let's just edit uh, one of these by changing it. So I want to make this a single user piece of data, which you can see here with the prop up. I can say click to make a single user copy, which is going to change it. So now I'm cylinder 002, which becomes confusing when you look at these, because these are actually unrelated. Unrelated. 02. You'll notice now this doesn't change. That's because my mesh geometry options here are separate from what my object is being named. If you use something like Unity, uh, the setup there is actually somewhat similar to this because you can have an object and then data contained inside of that object, which has its own name. Maya works the same way. I find it annoying. I don't like it, uh, but it helps give names to various things like this in here. For example, I could simply name this piece uh, favorite sill. And now when I pop between these different pieces of geometry, you'll see the name is different between all of them. This one's instanced three times, and this one is not. So when I edit this piece here, it is not changed. But this one is. Ta-da! Different instances, singular meshes, pretty easy to work with overall, I find. Now, if, however, I wanted to make this an instance of this object, how do I do that? Well, one of the things I really like in Blender is you can take an object that isn't instanced and turn it into an instanced object. So, for example, I can select these two objects and make sure that my active object is the one that I want to sort of propagate out everywhere else. I can go into object mode here, my object settings icon, scroll down into make links, and I can choose what kind of link I want to make. So this is really handy when it comes to instancing. It's a bit annoying because it doesn't take everything all at once, but it allows me to choose specific pieces of data to make links of. So the easiest one and the one that I use most of the time is object data. So I can just click object data and now they've been linked together. That link is instancing for all intents and purposes. So you'll see in here now, favorite cylinder is used in both of these pieces. Ta-da! Even more exciting is the fact that I can actually also go back to my previous geometry that I had. Remember unrelated O2? It's still around. I can still pull that up and have it work and switch to it. This is not something that I necessarily do a lot, uh, but the option is there and it is available for me, which is pretty cool. 
But again, I'm just going to switch to favorite cylinder, and that is another way of making that link in this case, is basically by saying this container of geometrical information is now going to use the favorite cylinder as its sort of geometry properties. So there we are. We've got a few pieces here, and we could start making some more elements, such as sort of this top section. Now, I could add another piece of geometry to this scene by sort of just going to add and going to mesh and going to cube, but I want to speed a few things up, which means we need to start making this interface work just a little bit smoother for us. So, how do we do that? I took a little pause for myself there, actually. Now, if we want to change our interface and make it a little bit more usable, because I think in this case, if you're used to working in 3D a lot, you might be a little tired of having to like select all these different things and open all these various big, big, big windows. There's a few ways that we can make this interface a little bit more manageable for us and a little bit easier to find things. So the way that we do that is through a few methods. First off, we can start changing our shortcut keys to being whatever we like. So, for example, I could change my pivot point on my objects in a really, really easy way. So the way that I can do that is by switching to this area over here. So Origins is one of my options. I'm going to duplicate my mesh here. Go to Origins and you'll see this piece. I just click this icon here and it actually lets me change my origin. So instead of having to do any of the right click kind of stuff that's going on here, I can just change it right here. And this is great. So I can go in here and I can turn that off. And so now I'm moving my geometry or I'm just moving my origin, editing that and putting it wherever I want. But the problem is, is like, this is pretty annoying to have to kind of go back and forth to. I really don't like doing that. How do I make this a little bit easier for myself? Well, I can right click pretty much anything in my interface, and I can assign a shortcut to it. So for example, for this one, I can click this and say insert. So insert, I happen to already know, is not associated with anything else. I recommend when you try to set a shortcut by default, try to click some stuff, see what you end up with. So now I can press insert, and I can start moving my pivot around to wherever I want. And then I can press insert again, and now it is sort of set to that location. This can be done with basically anything in my interface, even in these kinds of areas. So for example, duplicate linked, what I like is using Control shift d That allows me to duplicate a linked object really quickly and easily by just having this be Control shift d Whoop, scale that down. And now, all this stuff set up, I can use my uh, insert to move my pivot around, and you'll see that instances, of course, are actually associated with each other based on their pivot point. All that stuff stays linked. And I can press insert again to sort of just switch back to my default mode here. That is one of my favorite ways of being able to set up shortcuts for myself that don't already exist. It's really, really handy. It's really, really flexible. Uh, it gives me really quick ways of setting things up really quickly. And again, I highly recommend that you check which shortcut you're going to use, because one of the things that Blender's not great with is duplicate shortcuts within the same mode that you're working in. So what I mean by that is, if we go into our preferences under Edit, we can open up our key map settings. And if I go in here and search for insert, or well, actually rather go into my key binding and type in insert, you'll see I don't have a whole bunch of things turned on in here, but I do have this window mode turned on, and I've got my context toggle turned on, and my setting here is for, let's, let's scroll all the way through this, scene, tool, setting, use, transform, data, origin. Basically what's happening here is this is the command that's being used to turn on my origin selection mode. And this is the mode that allows this to turn on. Not all of these things are this complicated looking, but this is one of the examples of the more complicated ones. The way to find it was to check insert. And there's going to be different settings for these other parts. So these ones are being used in text mode. 
so I can copy and paste and toggle overwrite using insert when I'm in a text area such as probably something like this. Each different area when I select on it will have different types of shortcuts available to it. This is the same kind of thing you might run into in 3D Studio Max or Maya when you're in different uh, specific windows. Now, I can also access the name of other things such as bevel and I can see what the options are going to be for that as well in here. They can sort of tell me what most of the shortcut keys are for that. Now this one I'm finding actually particularly non-helpful, uh, which is not my favorite option in here, because usually they are more helpful than this, but bevel is clearly not in this case. Uh, let's do extrude. Extrude, if I could spell correctly. Uh, now you'll see here, it's also not really showing me a lot of useful settings in here. Normally, these show the key mapping, which is kind of what's really, really important here. But for some reason, it's not in this case. Um, not quite sure why, honestly. Usually that does show up, but I think there might be something going on with my version of Blender. I have deleted this version of Blender about 20 times in doing this tutorial. Generally speaking, this area will show uh, what the shortcut key is for that. You should be seeing it on yours, um, but generally that's what's going to happen in here. Um, but it's not, so I might be missing something. No big deal. I don't use this a whole lot because, generally speaking, I can get away with what I need by selecting a thing, right-clicking, and assigning a shortcut. So for example, in some areas here, I can press X and turn on my snapping. The type of snapping that I might use is in here. So I can snap to increments, which is going to be a grid snap, so a full unit. Now in this case, maybe this works fine for me, but maybe I want to switch to verts or something like that, and I want to do it easier. Well, I can right-click here, or rather right-click inside here, and say assign shortcut. My favorite one is Control shift x and now I can switch this on the fly in my viewport to being something like verts. So now I'm snapping to vertices instead, which is really handy. I'm going to switch this to active uh, snap mode, which just generally works a little bit better. And now I'm automatically just snapping to verts, which is really, really, really handy. So those are the kinds of things that you can do to speed up your workflow by just adding new shortcuts for yourself. Now, what you can also do is add in things to your quick access. So for example, if I open this up here and I see set origin and I go origin to geometry, which is what I use a lot, but I don't want to have to open up all these different windows and, and sort of menus to get to it. I want something a bit quicker. So I can actually right click this and say add to quick favorites. Add to quick favorites is going to add this to my uh, to shift tab, which is my quick favorites menu. This opens up anywhere in my viewport, wherever I want, and gives me access to things like this. So generally what I add to my quick favorites is things like make links, because this is a lot to search through. So I'll potentially add my object data make link, boop, and that'll allow me to immediately add that data there. Or even if I wanted to, in this case, I could add make links to that and switch to object data. So it, it maintains all of the extra menus if you want them. And if I want to get rid of it, I can remove it and you'll see it's gone. So those are the kinds of things that I like to be able to work with here. So things like transform, I can do, uh, oh no, rather clear. I can do rotation and scale, or I can do apply rotation and scale. This is one of my favorite ones. So if I make a shortcut for that, uh, apply rotation and scale, I'm just going to make a regular duplicate of this geometry. Uh, we'll say, take my rotations, all of them that exist, they are currently all being kept. I can change that to being locked in place, sort of a freeze transforms if you're familiar with Maya, or sort of a reset X form if you're familiar with Max. Sort of takes all of those rotations, all of those locations, and sort of locks them in. Same with scale. Let's scale this as well. So I can just go uh, apply rotation and scale, and that applies only rotation and only scale so that I don't actually apply this information to my location, which would actually move my origin, and I don't want that. So that is some of the easy ways of getting these sort of more difficult things set up. So 
This comes to our Add section here, which is one of my favorite ones to put into my Quick Access. I can just right-click this and say Add to Quick Favorites, at which point I see Add anywhere I want on my screen. I could also make this a shortcut if I wanted to, uh, if I wanted a specific one, but that is one of the easiest ways I can get through this interface. Next is pressing Tab. Tab is Search. Search in Blender allows me to look for any command that I am not aware of where it is located. So, for example, I could say oh, join, uh, which would allow me to, in this case, uh, add or join objects together. If I wasn't sure where that was in my interface, I could find it here. And it'll tell me that I can find, for example, uh, pipe elbows in my add mesh pipe joints pipe elbow. Okay, well, so add mesh should be pipe joints pipe elbow. That shows me the location of each uh, spot to look for in the interface. Now, I think they've changed it this way as well. If I wanted to, I could also assign shortcuts and add to quick favorites for any of these things as well, such as adding a Bezier curve to being something that I work with. So this is one of the fastest ways to learn where the, the, the functions that you want to work with without necessarily knowing where they are. This is what got me through a lot of my learning Blender uh, because trying to learn Blender when you have no idea where anything is is like any piece of software. It can be really daunting to just figure out how to find the thing that you want to do. But when you can just kind of type it in and find it, and it's all context sensitive too, so it's all related to what you're doing at that moment. It can generally help for how to find what you're looking for. So when you look online and somebody says, do this thing, you can search it rather than trying to find the menu options for where the thing is located. I find it really, really handy and really useful, and it's helped me figure out how to make Blender really, really work for me. So for example, my quick favorites list, is pretty, it's not super, super big. It's probably at least twice the size of that, but it helps me sort of sort out all the different things that I need to work with to make Blender work better for me more often. And I like it because I don't have to remember a shortcut key or something that is uh, more difficult to learn. I can just kind of always pop this window open. If I don't like a thing being there anymore, I can right click it and remove it if I need to. So that's what works for me. Now, back to our model. So let's start adding a few more pieces to this, such as uh, these other elements here. So I'm going to duplicate this up and start making this top section. But this piece here looks like it's actually a bit of a cube. So I want to add a, well, let's use our little extra mesh options in here, our addition options through our quick access, our quick favorites, and add a cube. Perfect. It's a little bit too big, but I can scale that down, push this up, scale it down some more, and push this into place. Now, again, I could turn on by pressing X, I could turn on my snaps and just snap this two verts if I needed to. Boop. And turn that off by pressing X again. And I could sort of scale this out, pull this in a bit. I think that that's going to be pretty decent. I'm mostly going to be covering this actually with this geometry. It'll be a lot easier just to kind of cover that up. No reason to keep that weird edge visible uh, for the sake of simplicity here. Now let's start adding in some extra information here. I want to add some of this bevel into this. So I'm just going to just press Control B or I can go over here to bevel. And I can middle mouse, click and drag anywhere in the screen to start doing that, or I can drag my little gizmo here as well. Now, there's one thing you're going to notice as we're doing bevel operations, or you'll notice it with a lot of other types of operations as well, which is while I've got this currently selected, I'm just going to ignore what's happening up here. I'm going to mouse down to this bottom section down here. So what's happening down there is it's showing me the different types of shortcut keys that I can press to speed my workflow up. So for example, I can see there's an S option here for segments. So I'm just gonna open this up a little bit here and press S. And now as I move my mouse, 
I'm actually changing the number of segments that I have available to me. And to uh, change a few more things, I could affect edges or do outer meter or inner meter. I could harden my normals if I wanted to. Uh, all of these options are available just by pressing the shortcut keys that are shown at the bottom. This is not my favorite way of displaying these things, but uh, it is the way that it is displayed in a lot of cases and uh, can give me a bunch of these shortcuts that I can use to sort of speed this process up. So again, I pressed S so that I can sort of add more geometry here, and then I can press A, as is shown at the bottom, if you see right here. Burp, 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 burp. Uh, I can press A to sort of change my width again, just to sort of get a an amount of a bend that I like. Now, once I've done this, I can still change all of these settings in here, but if you wanted to do them in the viewport as you're working with it, that's one of the ways that you can do this. So I could add more segments if I wanted to, uh, or I could change my, my meter setup. Uh, but in this case, I'll just go with 0.5, which is the defaults, and leave the rest as is. It's just fine for me. Now, one more thing that I can do here is add in an extra edge. To do that, I can use subdivide. That's one of the key ways of sort of adding an, an edge between a bunch of uh, equidistant uh, edges, sort of perpendicular, cut them up. It subdivides it along the angle that you've been working with. I could scale that out a little bit, maybe select this one, but just by double clicking that edge, I'm allowed to uh, sort of select the entire loop. Double click this, select the whole loop, give this a bit of a curve because you can see there's this sort of taper here and I can just bevel this again. So I'm just dragging up, getting myself to cover sort of this whole area, pressing S to sort of saw, like add in some extra segments here. Let's just scale that up a bit more. Let's go, let's go with the full coverage there. That works for me. So now I've created this sort of soft curve by adding extra segments in and just by beveling out that edge there. So that works pretty decent. Uh, I could sort of pull this up just a little bit more, get that shape a little bit more correct for what this piece is going to look like. Next I can add in some extra geometry such as these front pieces. So I'm just going to duplicate this piece and I just noticed that a bunch of, been, bunch of people have been playing Hades while I've been doing this recording uh, and I didn't think about it at first so I'm just going to pop in here and turn on focus assist because I forgot to do that in the first place which I usually don't but uh, I mean, with that in mind, Hades is a pretty great game. If you haven't played it, you probably should, seeing as so many of my friends are clearly loading it up and playing it today. But let's come back to the tutorial here, and let's work with this piece of geometry. So uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to delete that one again, because uh, that got totally thrown off. Let's duplicate this mesh, rotate it in this direction. If I hold Control, I can also lock the axes that I'm rotating in. Boop, boop, boop. Uh, now, if I'm not sure if I got the angle quite right on it, I can always see right over here or again in my object properties, sort of these are being duplicated across both sections. It just depends on where you want to access it at any given time. So I can just change this to 90 degrees if I want to lock that into place. So I can scale this down. I can move along the x-axis and the z-axis, sort of scale this down to something like that maybe scale this out right along the center and push it back in. Now let's grab this front face and scale that in. That's pretty good. I'm just trying to get the proportions right as I do something like this. And that's pretty good. Let's just start duplicating some geometry. So from here I can duplicate that geometry, scale it up a little bit, Maybe push it back into place a little bit more. Extrude to pull that back out. And I'm going to duplicate again. Scale down. Push in. Extrude. Same things that we've been doing this whole time. Just to create this sort of little cap right here. Now, if I wanted to select this whole piece of geometry, I can press up on the keyboard to sort of select more. Again, you can see any of those options as we go into here. When I want to say select more or less, you'll see that's in select more or less right here. Next active and previous active are also really, really handy when you want to simplify geometry. So let's do that right now. Let's duplicate this piece and scale this down and extrude again, just like we've been doing on all those other pieces. But what I want to make 
is this bolt. Now, there's a billion ways that I could do this, of course, but this is a good opportunity for me to explain select next. So what you'll see here is I've got, if this is the way that it was set up in the first place, probably about 24 faces. Now, the benefit of 24 faces is that it's actually equidistant on all sides. So it's cut right through the center and cut right through here because it is, um, oh, what, a prime number or something like that? I can't remember exactly what the term is, but it's just enough edges so that it will cut right through the center in all part, in, in all directions, vertical and horizontal. So what that means is, is an equal number of sides across the, the whole piece. Now, the way that I actually want to select this is by selecting each other edge. Uh, let's go back here and keep an end gone right there. So I want this piece, this piece, each other edge. Now to get that, I need to select one edge and then the next one. And I've already kind of made a pattern for myself, at which point I can say, select next active. Select next active is going to look at the selection pattern that I was using and just repeat that. Now what I can do is press G, which is repeat last. This is very similar to Maya. And so I can just press G over and over again to repeat that last operation. Now it's also worth setting up a shortcut key for something like next active and previous active, uh, but that's one of the defaults that's not there. Now I could delete this geometry just by pressing control backspace, or I can press delete and I get the worst options for deleting ever, which is this list. Generally speaking, you're not going to want to deal with this a lot, but you have to. Most of the time you're going to be deleting faces or vertices because deleting almost everything else creates sort of really unique edge cases that you're mostly not going to be dealing with. Faces and vertices are one of your key ones. However, in this case, we want to dissolve geometry. So when I press delete, I can say limited dissolve or dissolve edges, and that will actually get rid of the edge and the associated vertices with it. Now again, I could replicate that action that I was doing previously just by going select next active, G, 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 and then get rid of these. So control backspace will also do a dissolve selection and get rid of the vertices. And then you'll see right now we've got basically the same thing we had set up there. So that reduces the number of geometry that we have and reduces it evenly across the cylinder. Uh, this is sort of select and edge uh, in a lot of other pieces of software. They'll use that kind of terminology. And yeah, so there we go. I can sort of select the whole thing by pressing up, move this back into place. Just repeat that sort of increase selection all the time and move that into position. Ta-da! I've got that set up nicely. I'm just going to switch back to my uh, easier to work with uh, shading mode in solid. So that's pretty decent. Now I can basically just duplicate this geometry and put it so it's the center, rotate it on the x-axis, hold control to sort of lock that, and just make sure that this is minus 90 degrees, not 95. Pull this out. Uh, and scale this down, oops, oops, scale on the shift Y axis. There we go. Sometimes I'll just sort of move through those different options until I find what I'm looking for. Now I could handle this a little bit differently here by sort of selecting this piece, getting rid of its faces, pulling this piece out, and using my subdivide, which often I just set up to Control Shift E, assign shortcut, Control Shift E. There's no real particular reason, it's just this is one that I've used before in other pieces of software. Control Shift E, boop, boop, move this out. I'll use Control B, uh, which is my bevel, middle mouse drag to pull this out. And we can split this piece off if we want to. Now, I could select this piece here, this part, and I can go to Edge Split. So sort of break that off, which is going to now make this piece by itself. So select the whole thing. And now you'll see that this is a separated edge. Ta-da, <laughs> perfect. Now, this is separated and I wanna add some interior geometry to it, which is pretty easy to do. Uh, but let's scale this in just a little bit more so we can see all the parts here. I wanna fill this interior section. So I can right click 
and I can say fill. That's all. You're done. Just fill, fill, fill. Easy peasy. So now that that's done, I've sort of duplicated this geometry. I've got I've got it working pretty decently, but maybe I want to scale this up a bit more. Well, selecting up each time is a bit time consuming. So what are my other selection options here? Well, I could say select by trait or select similar and select more or less, select linked. Well, select linked is one of my favorite ones. Now this one is, let's be very clear, kind of misleading when we were talking about linking geometry earlier. Selecting linked in this case is things that are like sort of physically linked. So again, select, linked, linked. What that's gonna do is allow me to select all of my linked geometry with a limiting option being something like normals based on a certain angle or materials or seams or sharp UVs. Generally speaking, when I'm selecting this, everything's gonna be selected for the most part until I start working with different material types and sharpness settings and UVs and stuff like that. For now, it's gonna select my whole piece. Now, the nice thing is this already has a shortcut associated with it, which is my bracket, sort of square bracket. Perfect. So this is a bit quicker and easier to select a whole piece of geometry than what we were working with before. Now, let's just pull this out a little bit more here. Change the geometry. Uh, let's select both of these pieces. Sort of move that out. I think that's all working pretty decently, but I want to replicate this on the other side. The proportions of this are all off too, and it's driving me a little crazy, so I'm going to just scale that back in because I'm, I'm a real artist and I want to make sure that stuff's proportional. It's very important. Now, let's start thinking about modifiers because that's going to allow me to duplicate things on the other side and have that look, you know, nice and good and easy. And it's like instancing, but it's not, and it is. Well, let's go into our modifiers. Bang, my favorite. So modifiers in Blender are a lot like modifiers in 3D Studio Max. Uh, in that you can have a stack of modifiers, multiple modifiers that do all sorts of different things. Mirroring is one of the easiest to understand ones. So mirror, bing. What mirror is going to do is mirror my geometry. Don't you see how great it is? The problem is, is mirroring right now is actually mirroring my geometry on top of itself because my mirroring is always happening based on my pivot point. So I could change the direction of it so for example, you'll see here, I've now got geometry, boop, let's pop into isolation mode, which is again, shift I. And you can see that I've got this sort of duplicated. Well, that's not exactly what I want either. Uh, so let's pop back out and notice that we could change our mirror object. So right now my mirror object is myself, this piece of geometry, but I've got something that's supposed to be mirroring around, which is this geometry. And what I could do is pick this geometry to be my mirror object, bing. Now, in this case, that's not the result that I would have expected. That's because the axis is wrong. So I just need to pick something like the Y axis. There we go. And I'll see that the geometry is duplicated on the other side based on the orientation of this object. So if I, for example, rotate this object, you'll see my mirror is now sort of swapping and flipping based on this object's orientation. It's really, really handy. So as I push this in, the object is being mirrored on the other side and works quite nicely. Now, if, for example, let's just do another version of this here so you can see how mirror works because it's a really handy one and you're gonna use it a lot, so let's understand it. What we wanna do is get rid of the mirror object and I'm gonna change my pivot to rotate just a little bit so that my uh, mirroring is a bit more obvious as you can see for this x-axis. Now, if I'm mirroring and I you know, rotate my pivot, you'll see that the mirror happens like this. It's great. But the geometry is maybe not working the way that you might expect if you're coming from other pieces of software such as 3D Studio Max. The geometry is not being sort of cut into this. It's literally being duplicated. All we need to do in this case is bisect. What bisect is going to do is look along that axis and cut the geometry. Now, in some cases, your geometry might disappear and that's, or do something like this, which is just because you have flip needing to be turned on or off. So it is flipping the direction 
of the sort of bisection. So in this case, the, the cut that's happening through here is happening in this direction, which is what we want. But if it happened in the other direction, we'd be not really having the result that we want generally showing up. So just keep that in mind. You can turn flip on and off and bisect to actually cut the geometry. And the same uh, examples would happen if you were using a mirrored object instead. And merging is going to merge those pieces together as well. So there we go. That is mirroring. Mirroring is really, really great. I love it. It's very, very helpful. And it allows me to sort of scale things up, but maintain their position because it's all based on another object, which is just super, super handy. Perfect. So we've got something like this set up here. That's looking perfectly decent. It's in position. It's not fancy yet or anything like that, but it'll do just fine. Now, one thing you'll notice as well is my model is looking pretty unpleasant. It's very faceted. It's got hard edges everywhere, which we don't want. How do we fix that? Well, what we want to do is let's just go ahead and select literally every piece of geometry. And what we want to do is right click and say shade smooth. Boom. Awful. The reason that it is awful is because it is taking all of our geometry and just smoothing it out. Basically saying all of this just needs to be smooth and nice. The reason that that's not great is because generally speaking, objects shouldn't look like this. What we want to do is, uh, let's just actually select everything, make sure it's all still selected. Go into our uh, object data section and open up normals. Now what we can turn on is auto smooth. Auto smooth is going to automatically smooth our geometry based on face angle thresholds. So if if a face is sort of like this, like a 90 degree angle from another face, there will be a hard edge in between them. If it starts to get more and more shallow, it will start to soften out based on my angle threshold. That is right here. If I click this, turn it on, and I say 90 degrees, boop, then the face will uh, sort of break at that 90 degree angle and nothing else. But you'll notice, I'm not really seeing that change on anything. And for example, if I click this piece of geometry, you'll see auto smooth is not turned on. Aha, well, the reason that that's happening is because Blender has this super, super goofy way of doing this. If I select multiple pieces of geometry and I change a setting, it doesn't apply that change to all of the objects, only the active object. Remember that piece that we were talking about, the active object? Well, that's not what we want to do. What we want to do is apply this to everything. So when we change a setting, pretty much anything, we're only going to be applying it to the active object most of the time. However, if we want to have it applied to everything, we have to hold Alt and click and drag that option or this option. So I'm holding Alt while I click Auto Smooth, and that will allow the options to happen on everything that is available. And then I can change the setting in here to something like 30 degrees, and then get something that's going to be a lot more manageable for this mesh. So that all looks pretty decent. So just remember, Alt needs to be pressed in those cases to get things to break the way that you want. Now, we'll notice in here, this is smoothing not quite the way that I want, so let's switch this to something like maybe 50 degrees, and you'll notice that that's giving me a much nicer, smoothed result. Perfect. So we've got most of what we need here. It's, it's all right. It's a, you know, perfectly decent start. But maybe we want to take this a little bit further. Let's start to add in something like this chain onto the mesh, which means we need to start working with something called curve geometry, uh, or sort of a curve object. Before we get into curve geometry, let's make some things a little bit easier for ourselves in placing different types of objects and things like that. And that is using our 3D cursor. So the 3D cursor will allow you to place things in space based on where that is. By default, this 3D cursor is positioned at sort of 0, 0, 0 in the world. Now, that's not really where I want that to be most of the time. In some cases, I want to create a piece of geometry and have it be exactly where I want it to be. The way that I can do that is by using my 3D cursor. To access it, I just need to press C and I can place where my 3D cursor should be. If I place on nothing, I'm sort of placing it in the middle of uh, my view plane. And if I want it to connect to a piece of geometry, I just sort of 
sort of snap it there. Now, I can turn on snaps and my 3D cursor will actually snap to individual pieces of geometry or it'll snap to whatever I actually choose. In this case, it could be a face. I want to snap it there, but that's already going to happen by default. I could snap it to an edge center, which is really handy, such so as something like this or right there, and perpendicular edges, volumes, or whatever. Um, but I could also start using things called my snaps. So my snap settings are available inside Mesh, under Snap, and there's a bunch of options here. Now, I can also access all of this by pressing Shift X, which is what I use a lot. So I can snap my cursor, my 3D cursor, to my world origin, which I can just sort of scroll to by doing this. And you'll see my 3D cursor has now snapped to that location. So Shift X, and I can say 3D cursor to active or 3D cursor to selected. So if you've got multiple things selected and you want to select it to the active one, you can do that or just to select it. So for example, if I've got three or a bunch of uh, geometry selected here, boop, 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 I can say snap to active and it'll snap to my active vert, which would have been the last one that I selected. Or I could say to, to selected, which will go sort of in between in the median point in between all of those elements. So for example, the easiest way we can think of doing this here is I could snap my cursor to selected, which will snap it to the center of this face. And if I add a piece of geometry, such as a cube, and I shrink that cube down a bunch, whoop, you'll see that it is now in the center of this face, which is a really handy place to be spawning that kind of geometry. This is a faster way of moving things around and snapping things to various surfaces is by using this 3D cursor. You don't need it. You could basically never use it, but it's handy when you do, and especially when you associate it with your snapping options that are available here. So now that we know this again, we can sort of snap our cursor to the selected surface and add our curve object. So curve objects are objects that are sort of Bezier curves similar to the pen tool in Photoshop or NURBS curves in uh, Maya and just, you know, splines in Max. Uh, they've got a whole bunch of controls to them. I really like them a lot and I use them all the time. In this case, let's add a circle. So the circle is oriented in a direction that we don't really need in this case, but I can jump into edit mode. In this case, there's actually only two modes to work with here. I don't have sculpt modes and things like that with curves, just object mode, edit mode. And I can select all of the geometry here with just control A and scale it all down. And I could also rotate on the Y axis it looks like. And, and if I wanted to speed this orientation up, I can just press 90 and it's going to rotate it to the 90 degree axis as I rotate. So it's one of the fast ways you can sort of speed some of this process up. And then I can just scale this down some more so that it kind of wraps around this surface here. Now, I'm going to select both of these pieces, move them out just a bit more, give myself some space to work with. And what I can do now is go into my spline object data properties and scale this up. So inside the geometry section in here, I can increase its depth. Pull that up and you'll see that's going to scale this up here. Now, if this is going too fast for you, if you're finding that this is just scaling too quick, all you have to do is hold shift and drag on this and it'll work out quite a bit better. Now, oddly enough, I have a little bit of a twist in here, which doesn't normally happen. Um, so I could clear tilt. Let's clear tilt on all of these. This should not normally be happening. Uh, I almost never see that happen. So in this case, let's just rotate that a little bit. For whatever reason, this piece is messing up. It's actually the first time I've seen that happen with a base circle. But it happened in my demo, so that's going to be exactly how this is going to work. But basically what I want to do is I want to duplicate this piece that we're seeing right here, this little bit of geometry here. All I need to do is just add a little bit of extra shape in here and it'll give me something that's decently interesting. Now, the way that I can do this in the easiest way is just right click and go to subdivide. What subdivide does is add in extra geometry to sort of match the current curve. And I can just pull this down right here and I could adjust this curve just a little bit if I wanted to as well. That's pretty simple, gives me the shape that I want. And then I could just rotate this a little bit just to give it that little bit of character that we're seeing over there. 
Easy. Well, how do we make the chain? Well, there's a bunch of modifiers that we can use to do that. So, you know what? Let's add another curve circle. And let's scale this in. And let's rotate it in object mode. Pull this out here. And let's add in a bit of extra information here. So what I would recommend is looking at close at a piece of geometry like this, seeing what the shape is, and I'm just going to kind of replicate it in a, in a really, really simple way. I'm going to just subdivide this whole thing, pull these two parts in, whoop, I think push these two parts out a little bit, and then let's rotate the geometry here, sort of this edge. I'm not doing anything fancy. It's, uh, it's pretty, pretty rough but it'll give me the basic shape that I need to work with. Now, I can sort of pull some of this in, pull some of this in, so the shape's a little bit nicer. But I think that'll do just fine for what we need right now. Now again, let's increase the depth of this, and let's scale this down, and just kind of place it on this surface here, see if that works decently. I think I can add a little bit more depth to that, but this will work just fine. Now, I'm going to take the rotations, zero them out, until it's something like this. So that works just fine. I think it could be prettier and fancier or something like that, but honestly, what works, works. Now, let's rotate this back up, and let's add a spline shape for ourselves. Something that's going to wrap around and go from this point to the other. So uh, let's just do an add curve bezier. So this is sort of a simple bezier curve. Just drop that in there. And what you see here right now is a curve that is basically uh, bezier in nature. So it's got this little bezier section here. I can scale this up and down. Similar to what we had before, but just a, a little bit more um, abbreviated, a little bit simpler. It doesn't have the full curve, it doesn't have the full circle, but we could turn it into a circle if we wanted to, we just don't need to. So what we're going to do is I'm going to turn on my snaps, I'm going to snap this to these vertices, turn off snapping just to kind of get this rotation and correction set up, then I'm going to use snaps again by holding control, it's going to turn on my snaps mode instead of even needing X, and rotate this such that I get this set up the way that I want. Now I can scale down this bezier, rotate it the way that I need, and just line all of this up. Boot to doot, easy. Now I can also subdivide this once more just to get the kind of shape that I might want. Checking it from all angles. Let's pick something like that. I think that'll be decent. Now to duplicate this mesh across that curve, which is real handy and real easy to do, all I need to do is add in a modifier, which is going to do an array. So the array modifier is going to duplicate my geometry multiple times, and it's going to be a relative offset in this case, which is going to say basically, based on the size of my geometry, duplicate this thing. So what's nice about this is as I scale this up or down, the array moves with it. It's especially handy here if I start to push this down. Things will generally start to move based on the scale of my object, which is handy. Now, again, I'm just moving this up so that this looks like they link together. Now, I can increase the count of this multiple times, and that's pretty good bit. But how do I get this to attach to that piece of geometry, to that uh, curve? Well, all I need to do now is, say, deform curve. The deform curve is basically going to allow me to deform my mesh based on a curve. So I'm going to pick that curve right here. And I can now pick the axis that I want it to go on, which in this case may be the x-axis. I say may be the x-axis because my two pieces of geometry may be oriented differently, and that's located inside my rotations. So they may have different orientations which can cause things to sort of deform differently. Ideally, you want these things to have the same orientation so that it's really nice and easy to understand. But it's hard to remember. So, 
In this case, let's just do the clunky, kludgy, stupid person way of doing it. I say stupid person because that's the way that I make stuff. Let's use the z-axis because that's what would make sense to me. And it looks like it's going up. You know what? Let's try the minus z-axis. Perfect. That's looked like That looks like that's working just fine. I'll actually bring it closer to the mesh. But you know what? Let's make it perfect. So I'm going to click this edge, this spline, this curve, and I've got my current one selected. I'm going to press Shift X, which is going to bring up my snaps. If I don't want to do that, remember I can also go to Object and go into my snaps, which is available here as well. But again, uh, let's just go Shift X, and I'm going to say Selection to Active, which is going to take my selection and move it to the active selection. Boop. And now they are matched up nicely. So in this case, that's working all right, but I think the location of each pivot is off just a little bit. So I'm just gonna turn off my uh, curve here. So I wanna hide that. And we'll notice that right now, my pivot of this maybe isn't quite where I want it to be. So I'm gonna just change my pivot location to be a little bit higher right here, uh, which will line up a little bit nicer with this. Now what I also wanna do is make this my origin point for my selection. So I can do snaps. I can change my, uh, no, actually I wanna change my origin. So I'm gonna to go to my curve. Where is it here? I always forget where these things can be located. Well, this is an easy one. I'm going to use my 3D cursor to actually do this. So I can switch this to being cursor to selected. Now my 3D cursor is there. I can go into object mode and say, set origin to 3D cursor. This allows me to lock the 3D cursor and origin into the same location and get that point. The reason that this is useful is because I can match each thing really, really closely together and keep a lot of accuracy. So again, selection to active. Now these things are matched up. So now my curve can go nicely with this. So now I could increase the number of points that I have here, which will uh, add to my array and work quite nicely, but even better, I can also fit to curve. So my array could fit to this curve and would automatically scale appropriately. Now, that doesn't look correct. That's because, again, because this is based off of my scale of my objects, this thing is actually a little bit confused about how big my chain is in reality versus my curve. So they're, they're a little bit mixed up. That's fine, easy to fix. Let's go to object and we can go to apply and we can go to scale. So applying in Blender is the equivalent of freezing transforms, as I said earlier, in uh, Maya or resetting X form in Max. It sort of zeros out whatever you were doing for each thing. So I can say scale, zero. And now these two things are the same. And so now it knows that it has to cover that full distance. And at this point, I can move this kind of up or down a little bit just to try to make sure that that matches nicely. And most of the time, especially in my previous examples, this uh, matches a little bit closer, but let's bring that down a little bit. Maybe move this a little. But now you can see I can move my curve around and this thing will duplicate all over the place and be really, really easy to work with. So I can also just scale this down a little bit if I want this to match a little bit nicer. And I can duplicate this geometry. In fact, actually let's uh, duplicate linked because that's fun. And let's use our snaps to faces to snap this to that face there. Let's rotate on the Z axis. Let's rotate this way a little bit. Let's pull this in here and let's scale it down. I'm gonna lose a little bit of volume in it, but I'm not too concerned about that in this case. So now I can make sure that my edge here sort of matches up right here and works quite nicely. Now, if for example, this curve doesn't quite work right, see this is sort of busting into this section here. Well, there's one great thing we can do with curves in Blender, which is right click and say tilt. Tilt will actually change the orientation of the curve itself, which is really handy in a lot of cases. So I can gradually just kind of rotate this to tilt it into location and it just gives me a lot of flexibility there. So now, as I move and edit this, it'll work quite nicely and we've got a chain 
easily present here. And the nice thing, of course, is I could change the actual geometry of this as I need. If I was like, ah, you know what, I want this curve to be just, you know, a little bit nicer. Maybe pull these pieces out just a little bit. Maybe change the orientation of certain spots here. Again, if I actually change this, you'll see this moves with it uh, because I am using my relative offset here in my modifiers. So that's pretty decent. I could just kind of move some of that stuff, maybe give myself a little bit more of a gradual curve. And if I need to, I can move this geometry around a little bit more. Just to keep things nice and pleasant, I can do another tilt. Just maybe trying to get that angle lined up nicely. There we go. Oop. And that's pretty decent. Now, I can also turn on in my modifier stack the ability to still view the uh, actions happening, my modifier stack happening while I am in edit mode, which is handy. So I can kind of move these things around while I am in edit mode. It's still going to show me my verts in their original location, but it's still better than nothing. So that's pretty decent. It's a bit of a clumsy link in the chain, but it'll work for what we're trying to do. So that's great. So now we could start maybe trying to refine and clean up this model a bit more and see what other options we have to work with to make this look real nice. All right, so now that I've got my model, give or take, set up in the basic way that I need, I can start making this look more interesting, start getting into some of the details and starting to refine, refine certain things. So let's start sort of fixing some of this geometry here. Let's start kind of tidying things up. One thing we want to do here is probably start pulling out some of these edges. Now, if we want to do this a little bit more organically, we can use something called our proportional uh, deform, uh, which is right here. Proportional editing, rather. A shortcut for that is B. Uh, so I can turn that on and off by pressing B. Now I can also move things proportionally. Now what you're seeing right now in this case is I'm moving everything. That is because my proportional editing is, as you can see, very, very big. It's far too big. So how do we edit that? Well, what we got to do is while we move something, we can go down on our mouse wheel, scroll down a whole bunch, or press a uh, page down. And in this case, it's not uh, not moving down too quickly. There we go. Uh, again, yeah, mouse mouse wheel down, mouse wheel up. Uh, will bring that down. And I must have been going in the opposite direction while I was doing it. So I generally use uh, mouse uh, or page down rather uh, while I'm doing this because I use a tablet pen while I'm moving things around. So what that's going to do is just allow you to change the proportions of these things as you go. So that's decent enough, but uh, something's just off here a little bit. Let's uh. Let's move things back into their default position. Now, there's a few more things that we can do here. So I can turn proportional editing on, and I can turn on symmetry. So symmetry works actually pretty decently inside of Blender. Uh, by default, I can turn on, let's bring this uh, size down a bunch. There we go. Boop, boop, boop. So I can edit this now, and it's happening on both sides. The reason it's happening on both sides is because the model is symmetrical. All the geometry is the exact same. There's probably spots where this is going to screw up, but I've had pretty decent results with symmetry turned on in a lot of different circumstances. This is one of those. If symmetry wasn't working, I could easily turn on my modifier for uh, mirror, and it would work just fine. So again, I can sort of scale this down, kind of pull this edge out. Maybe pull it out along that edge as well. Turn B off and just sort of adjust the proportions here. I may even in this case sort of bevel this. Again, press S to sort of pull that back out and press A to do this and just pull that back out a little bit more. Again, for this piece, I could just kind of turn on proportional editing, scale that down just a bit more just because I, I want to get this, this angle just a little bit better than I was getting before and a little bit cleaned up from this. Uh, so I'm going to turn off B, just get this angle a bit nicer. A lot of this is just trying to maneuver this into a position that looks nicer than what we had before. Now you notice there's a hard edge here. I'm just going to go in here into my object properties and increase the uh, auto smooth distance so that that gets nice and cleaned up. So that should be just fine. I do think there's a possibility that I could try modifying this down just a bit more 
just to kind of mimic this shape just a little bit more. I'm not seeing it in the image here, but I think it just makes the result of this look a little bit better on some of these surfaces. Uh, for this back section here, I could easily see selecting something like this, grabbing this kind of an edge, and maybe pulling that out a little bit. That's not too bad. Using proportional editing allows me to keep this looking nice and smooth. And then I can sort of come in here with, uh, whoops, there we go, with some extra edges just to kind of make a, a bit more of an interesting shape at the back here. Now, normally I wouldn't want to leave certain sections like we're seeing here uh, in wireframe mode. So actually one thing I do here is right click, assign shortcut, shift F. Shift F I like because it ap happens to be the same as uh, uh, something like in ZBrush. Uh, but unfortunately in this case it's popping me into uh, zoom, which in this case isn't going to work for me. Uh, I normally turn that off, but I I'm just going to keep that off for now. But basically what I can do is see that these edges are getting really close together. I'm normally not too concerned about them, but we might as well look at merging some edges together a little bit here right now, which can just be right click and go into vertices and just say, let's do merge vertices, collapse, and just do the same thing here as well. Merge vertices, collapse, collapse, collapse. I'm just pressing G in this case to do that. And then if I want to, I can use my modifier mirror to sort of make that the exact same on the other side. Make sure that we're bisecting this, make sure the flip is correct, and then I'm using the correct axes, which I think I wasn't. Flip, there we go. So I just need to find the correct one. And now the shading on this will work quite a bit nicer than it was before. There we go. It's not perfect, but it's fine. I've got a little bit of a curve back here that just sort of makes that look a bit nicer in this case. Just pull that out just a little bit more just to match that back in a way that I think is just a little bit more satisfying than what we were seeing previously. They may not even be what this model is doing, but uh, it's something that I would prefer mine do just for the sake of uh, consistency. Now I could also pull this up a little bit more, potentially even scale it down. Let's uh, pull that in just a little bit. I think that looks nicer. It looks a little bit more like the original as well, which is uh, which is fine. Let's take some pieces off here as well. Let's duplicate this. Let's separate it. And you'll notice that in duplicating this and separating it, I actually still have something with mirror on it. That's because uh, my modifiers are maintained across uh, separated objects. So I'll just delete that. And in this case, let's go to origin to geometry, rotate this by 90 degrees, and we could snap this onto that surface. We can also, if we need to, Select this edge here. That's not a great spot. What I was going to do was snap my cursor to selected and then snap my uh, selection to cursor. Uh, but that's not really in the center anyways, so I don't really love that. So I'm just going to eyeball it in this case, which is fine. I could also turn on my edge centers for snapping and get that into at least the center of that edge and pull this up. That way this thing will actually be centered into uh, sections that I actually want it to be centered on. Now some of these pieces here, I just want to modify a bit more because they are... Ooh, let's turn off my proportional scaling. Uh, there we go. Let's go with this. I just want, I want a little bit more of an overlap on that face there. And I can pull this back technically using this. There we go. That pulls that back. That's decent. Uh, yeah, that's fine. I think I'm okay with that. The intersection there is a little bit funny, but for the purposes of this, I think it's okay. No, I don't. This is the thing that I'll always run into with these kinds of things is I always want it to be a little bit more precise than it probably needs to be, but this will be fine. Okay, so let's start to look at a few of these pieces here. One of the things that I can start to do for this kind of geometry as well is add in some bevels and things like that. What's going to start making this look 
quite a bit nicer and quite a bit more polished. Now I could go in and add in bevels just, you know, sort of this way, add them in, have something that's that's pretty decent. But I could also do it with modifiers, which is one of the things I really like to do in cases like this. I can add in a modifier. Let's look at our wireframe. And you'll see what's happening here is not always ideal. So I'm actually beveling each and every single edge, which is not really what I want. So what I am going to do, let's just hide this for visibility sake, is select every edge that I can and start trying to use what is called my bevel weight. So as I increase this, you'll see the edge gets more blue kind of see it if I zoom in a little bit more. And I can actually change the amount of that. So the amount of bevel weight means the amount that this is going to bevel when the bevel modifier is applied to this. So in this case, my bevel modifier can use a, a limit mode called weight. Let's show this and make it visible. And what will happen is now for every single edge that is weighted for it, that will get the bevel modifier. So if I decrease the weight that's happening here, you can see this here in this case, it's going to decrease the amount of beveling that goes on on each edge. So for example, these two edges, let's add a bevel weight to them, and you'll see that they start to bevel more. Now if I start to increase the threshold of it, what happens is this starts to go down. That's because there is a clamp that's happening inside one of these pieces, uh, it is stopped based on a clamp, there we go, clamp override. So clamp override is going to keep this from overriding my bevel to getting to be too big. So let's change my bevel weight. Uh, if I go too far here, then my bevel will start to overlap itself, which is what we don't want. So just use a little bit of this or use clamp override. But when I clamp the override, for the distance, then once I hit a maximum distance, everything else starts to shrink down, which is not necessarily what you want in those cases. So just be aware of like that's kind of why that's happening in this case. Uh, but I can select all sorts of pieces of geometry, give them their own kind of bevel, and that can work uh, pretty nicely when I'm looking at a model like this. Now there's one more thing I can do in here, which is what I love, which is hardened normals. So when I turn this on, what it does is it adds hardened normals along the surface that has uh, been beveled, which is really, 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 really handy. And it makes the geometry look really nice, look really smooth, uh, while maintaining actually very, very few polygons. Now, let's just turn on wireframe one more time here and check out what's going on in here. So you'll see when we filled this, we added a whole bunch of extra geometry in here that we don't really want. So how do we fix this? How do we get rid of this geometry? Well, there's a few things we can do. We could probably do select, select similar, and probably even go direction. Uh, that's not ideal. Maybe even go with uh, select, hmm. Nah, easiest one in this case is to select circle. Select circle allows me to just sort of paint my selection. And I can just quickly paint in all these extra edges that I don't want to have. Let's uh, make sure that we only select the ones that we really want to get rid of, not the extra outside edges. Perfect. Then I can just oh, make sure that's, yep, control B or control backspace rather to get rid of those and just do the same on the other side. There's other like fancier ways that we could likely do this, uh, but I'm not going to get into them because we don't really need them for most of what we're doing. And this is a pretty simple issue. So just get rid of those. Do the same down here. This is like the clumsiest way we could be doing it. Don't get me wrong. But it'll work. Boop. Boop, 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 boop. Just deselect these and select these edges. I'm just trying to make sure that I don't touch any of the other parts that I actually want to keep, such as that. Doot, 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 doot. Perfect. That should be all of them. Control backspace. Oop, I got one too many right here. There we go. Now I can select this, bring it back into position. In fact, in this case, I'm not actually too upset if it's off just a little bit. It'll uh, kind of look nice. So the reason that I wanted to do that, let's switch back to my box selection mode. It's a little bit easier to select things like this. 
is because I was often getting, yeah, there you go, uh, little miss selections like that. And uh, beveling won't work quite as well when I've got funny sort of cuts in the geometry like that. Those are only funny because they're not at a great angle. So I'm going to add in bevel weight to this. I'm just going to do full weight on those as well. Actually, let's go, let's go like 39%. Uh, and let's get rid of these extra extraneous edges that I don't need. Uh, hide these changes here so I can see these edges that were causing bevel issues. There we go. Let's turn that back on there. So now I can select all these edges again. Uh, now if I want to select all edges that are related to this in terms of edge weight, that's where select similar can come in handy, or I can select ones that are uh, sort of have a similar bevel threshold as this one, and then I can change their weight. So let's go back quite a bit. I only need them to have a little bit of a bevel, and I think that'll look totally decent there. Sweet. So now I could select a piece like this, scale it up a little bit, give it a little bit more shape there, add in some extra pieces here if I wanted to, such as an extrude, potentially scale based on a different angle. So for example, in here, I could change my transform based on the normal. So I'm looking at my generalized normal here and just scaling based on that. So that's pretty decent. Let's uh, increase our angle threshold here, probably to something like, I think in this case, 85 is not bad. 85? maybe a little bit less. I think we're getting some funny results here because this extruded out and now I don't have the correct bevel angles here. Boop, bevel weight. Uh, we can see what my bevel weight here is in my edge data, which is just shown right there. So these pieces, let's select those, set their bevel weight to 0 0.03, I think it was. 0 0.03. No, that's not it. <laughs> uh, let's change that there. Bevel weight, 0 0.03. There we go. Could add in another little bevel right here. Two. I'm just kind of watching this edge here, seeing how that goes. There we go. It's getting a little bit blobby in there. I'm not loving the look of that kind of bevel going on in this place. So I may actually, instead of using the bevel in this case, I'm going to literally bevel it because I want a bit more control here over the shape that I'm getting. And that's that's all right. It's not, that's not great. Um, but we could start to move some geometry around to get the shapes that we're looking for. I just want to grab these interior parts and pull them in a little bit. That will help some of the beveling of other geometry a little bit more here. But it's giving me some non-perfect results, but it is giving me my larger shape, which I'm okay with in this case. So let's check this other section here. This model, I can actually just toss the same bevel modifiers on if I want. So the way that I can do that is just by adding my modifier, or I could even do potentially a link. So I could make a link with modifiers. And you'll see on this model now, I've got my same exact bevel modifier there. And we can change my uh, weight amount to being none or to being a angle threshold. So such as 45 degrees or something like that. That would mean that any geometry that is a 45 degree angle difference is going to be nice and visible and, and sort of beveled for me. So let's just increase the amount here. Actually, that is about the, the largest amount that I can do because of this edge. So as I pull that out, you'll notice more geometry can actually uh, be beveled. But that's all right. We don't need We don't need a lot of beveling going on in this case, just a little bit. And for a surface like this, I'm going to bevel that manually and add some extra geometry to it as well, because I think that'll work quite a bit better. Let's increase my shading change to be something larger. And then now my modifier can do a little bit less work, which I think will look nicer in most cases. So let's pull this in, just give a nice overlap there. 
and we're starting to get something that's a little bit more interesting. So I'm going to use my 3D cursor to add in another cylinder. Boop, right here. Let's scale this down. Oop, not that far. Scale that down like this, just to duplicate this piece here. But you know what? The amount of detail it has isn't quite enough. So let's go mesh. Let's go cylinder. Let's decrease it its amount to something like five. So I think that that's going to work a little bit more appropriately for this. Actually, let's go six. Yeah, that'll be fine. Scale this based on my x-axis. Oop, I'm, <laughs> I'm rotating based on my normal, which is not what I want. Or scaling based on my normal. There we go. Scale down. Scale down on x. Scale down on x not too far. It was flipping on itself. Something like this is pretty decent. There we go. That's, that's kind of all right there. Pull this up. I'm going to duplicate this out. Scale it in. Extrude down. Extrude down. Just kind of pull this in. Uh, this piece here, I'm going to make sure that it shades smooth, but I'm going to turn on my auto smooth. Increase that to like 45, 50. That'll be all right here. Let's lower that a little bit more, just so we get just a simple version of that underlying shape in here. That is pretty decent. I don't love the shading that's going on in there, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to increase this to 80. Now everything is smoothing too much, but I want direct control over my shading. So I'm going to select all of these edges, and I'm going to set them to being mark sharp. What Mark Sharp will do will actually say that this auto smooth doesn't matter when it comes to a sharp edge. A sharp edge is 100% of the time sharp. So that's going to work perfectly for me. That will give me the kind of shading that I'm looking for in any of those spots. So that is great. So now what I'm going to do is add my modifier for mirroring. And this is really handy in here. Where is it? I always forget. Mirror. There we go. Now I'm going to mirror around this object. Uh, actually, let's mirror around my cylinder. That's not too bad, but that actually might be causing some trouble because of that location. But let's see. I'm going to mirror around the other axes as well. And that's all right, but I don't love the way that that's working. So I may just modify this shape just a little bit to encompass that because I don't love it totally getting cut out of there. But the nice thing is, is I can move my geometry around, and my mirror will duplicate everything around it, which keeps things working a little bit nicer. I'm just going to modify that edge as well so that everything kind of sits nicely together. In this case, I'm perfectly fine with changing the structure of what this fire hydrant would actually be, uh, just for the sake of sort of keeping this tutorial nice, clean, fun, enjoyable. Let's duplicate this down because it's an inst. Actually, let's uh, let's straight up make sure that this is an instance by using Control Shift D or again duplicate linked. Bring that down and give us most of the pieces that we want here. So this is all good. Let's duplicate this piece, or we could even mirror because we can mirror and use modifiers on our uh, curves as well. Let's duplicate around this which is the correct axis. There we go. That's perfect. And let's see, that should be fine. I've got no problem with the way that that looks. Technically, this curve is going to be attaching to this piece in here. There's like a little uh, lip right inside here, a little curve section, which is kind of neat. Let's go ahead and add in a another cylinder. So then I'm just going to rotate this, scale it down, rotate it, uh, make sure that that is 90 degrees, scale it down like this, pull it over, let's pull it a little bit there, and let's do 
delete. Select both sides here and extrude. So I'm going to sort of lock this into, whoops, too, too big. Let's do that again there. Uh, press Z and then zero just to sort of pull this out. There we go. I can select both sides here. Now one way to sort of flatten this really easily is just to sort of scale it on the axis that you want and press zero and that will basically flatten an edge. I do this all the time for flattening pieces of geometry. Now I can use a bridge operation here, bridge by edge loops, uh, and I could actually basically do this across the whole thing, except for this section. Boop, boop. Uh, bridge by edge loops. There we go. So that'll be just fine. That's all we need here. Now in this case, it looks like this is rendering a little bit weirdly, and I may have scaled it down too far. And so now I'm actually looking at back faces, which is why the shading is like a little odd. So all we need to do to fix stuff like this is to just check and make sure. So one thing we can do is check our, uh, I remember the setting is in here, face orientation. Ta-da! Face orientation is going to tell us that those are actually back faces. So if we want to fix that, we can go into our face, uh, or is it in mesh, normals, there we go. And we can say flip. Now, of course, this is where it's handy. I can also just type in flip in my search, and I'll get what I'm looking for here. I could even type in normals. And then I've got all of the options related to normals available to me here. So these are the handy ways that we can sort of find the options we're looking for. So flip is there. That works great. Start to pull this out a little bit. If certain faces are looking not flat the way that we want, let's just flatten them out. So for whatever reason, I scaled this in a way that did not work well. Flatten this. Perfect. And now I can potentially start to attach some geometry to that in the same way that I did here. So I'm going to duplicate this. And in this case, I really can just sort of attach my mesh, my sort of curve into that location and bring this right here. I am using the correct kind of snapping. So if I hold control, I can snap to this edge, rotate out like that, and bring this up. The nice thing is, is because all of this is still set to being um, uh, arrayed based on my curve length and curve size, then I'm actually still getting all the same results that I want before. You can just kind of pull this out and do something pretty reasonable. There we go. Uh, let's turn back off that face orientation because we don't really need to see that. But now that works pretty decently. All right. Now let's say I actually want to bring this in a little bit and let's lift that back up so it's close to where its pivot point should have been in the first place. I'm just lifting it straight up and Let's go adjust our size of this because I think it just doesn't feel right to be quite that thick for this one. So I want to kind of scale that down just a little bit more. Perfect. And we can just adjust our array just to shift that down just a little bit more. And in this case, let's go adjust the location of this. Let's adjust the size of this here. There we go. Perfect. I think that that looks a bit more convincing in this case, which might mean that I might pull the scale of this one down, but I think I'll leave it for now. I'm fine with them being two different sizes for the sake of this demo. But that's pretty decent. That's most of what I need here. I can scale some pieces up just to look a little bit more like the original image. Pull some of these pieces out. I could give some of these things more bevels, all that kind of stuff. Uh, all of this is still available to me. It's all nice and iterative. I can have this still based on angle thresholds. Let's pull that down a bit more. It's, it's all right, but let's do some shading changes. Harden those normals, because I always just think that, that looks really nice, personally. Uh, let's go 35 degrees on that again. Pull that out. And in this case, I do want my bevels to come from my much greater control from my edge bevels. Let's uh, do that. Let's do it based on weight. And let's do these. Yeah, let's do, let's do this whole thing based on bevel weight. 
then I just get nice control over exactly how beveled this should be. And the results can just be a lot more convincing, a lot more compelling, and a lot nicer overall. Same with this, bevel weight. And then I can just do that make link again. Make link, modifiers, perfect. And now in this case, I just want to duplicate those modifiers across all those objects because even though these are instanced, the modifiers do not duplicate over top of instances. So just something to keep in mind. I want to link to modifiers. Oops, remember, <laughs> this one, your active one, is the one that is being duplicated. Perfect. So there we go. There's like a, a relatively decent start to some of this mesh. Now, the last thing we could start thinking about is how we add materials to this object and what that material process can be like. It's not very complicated, but let's go through it anyways, just because it's nice to have a, a full understanding of what we're working with. All right, so let's add some materials to this object. <clears throat> how do materials work? Well, let's pop over into our materials area and we can see that we've got technically no material attached to this object. And that's not ideal. So let's just jump into our material preview area. That's our viewport that's gonna show us our material properly. And let's add a new one. Now you'll see it is almost as if nothing changed. That's because in a way, kind of nothing did. The non-existent default material, non-existent in quotation marks, is basically this material it's just technically, if you're exporting this mesh or combining meshes and stuff like that, the model and the object will act as if there is no material attached to it um, because it's just kind of faking it for the purposes of making things viewable and nice. So we've got one now though, let's just call this paint. And what this thing is gonna do is be our paint material. So I've got a whole set of options here. Now this is a sort of physically based default rendering that we can use to our advantage. It's not uh, perfect, it's not the best in the world, but it, it is quite good and it looks quite nice and it'll work for most situations. So let's just use the default. So let's make this red. Now we could even actually color pick from our scene and pick that if we wanted to as well, or, or go something a little bit darker and that'll work uh, decently for us. Now, how do we duplicate this across the rest of the geometry? Well, let's select the geometry that we want, getting rid of everything we don't, uh, such as, yeah, let's keep, let's keep all of this, but not that, not this, all the rest of it should be fine. So now I'm gonna select this, my active object, go to this little drop down and say, copy material to selected. Now, remember our links thing that we were talking about many, many times already? Well, remember, we could also use that in here as well to make those links. So the same thing can happen here, copy material to selected, and now all of these objects have that material. So that's decent. Now I could add in a little bit more specularity to it if I wanted to, or decrease the roughness, or increase the uh, glossiness basically by lowering the roughness. And I get something pretty decent. And uh, that's basically all I need to do for something like this. Now, how about these pieces? Let's make this a metal. That's a, that's, it's all right. And let's increase the metalness on this. So that's decent. Let's make sure that we duplicate this across all the metal type objects. And let's link, let's just do the two different versions of this. Oh, again, I didn't link it in the correct directions. Make links, materials, there we go. Now again, actually, just so you notice, uh, I didn't have, I had this thing selected first as my sort of main object. And when it tried to link to everything else, because it had no material, it actually didn't link to everything else because it had nothing to link. Uh, so just always bear in mind, when something doesn't have a material attached to it, intentionally, it has nothing attached and it does nothing, uh, which you'll actually find out is pretty handy in most situations. So there we go. So now we've got a shiny metal. Uh, we could increase its shininess if we want, just for contrast sake. And we could edit this surface in here, maybe make it a little bit less specular, a little bit more rough. And in fact, in this case, I want to go a little bit more sort of a classic red and a little bit darker to make that a little bit nicer. Now, 
that is most of what we want, but there's some pieces that we're seeing like this, which is technically metal. So we've got an object right here that is two surfaces. Well, the way that we could do this is by separating this geometry and then applying the material that we want, such as metal, to this piece. And that works perfectly fine. We've got two objects. But what if we want this to stay as one object? And there's big control Z's going on there. But basically, if I want this to stay as one object, how do I add another material within this object? Well, all I need to do is add a material slot. This material slot can be associated with metal. So this is showing me all of my various materials. I can make this metal. And then I can assign this geometry to the metal layer by assigning it. And so now you see I've got the metal assigned to that one section there. And the paint, there we go, assigned to the other section. So, ta-da, did it. I feel exceptional about myself. And that's basically it. That's all I really need to do to start applying materials to things. Now, what if I wanted to apply things like textures? In this case, all we're doing is applying really, really basic, basic colors to this by just clicking these pieces. Well, we can do a little bit more here. Uh, and the way that I'm going to do this is by using a website called uh, sort of Creative Commons Textures. This site is really great for using Creative Commons textures. It is uh, cc0textures.com. And these are all Creative Commons textures. So you can use them for whatever you want. We could search something like paint, which is what I did, and find a paint that you would want to work with in this case. So for example, I actually use this one. And it's what I'm going to be grabbing uh, for this example. So you can download whatever they've got. It's all free to use. You can use it for commercial products. You can use it for anything that you want. Uh, they've got more information about it, but it's a great website. It's all free, which is very much in keeping with what we're doing using Blender. And all I need to do now is pick my base color. This little dot here will allow me to choose what type of texture I want to put in. Now, because it is a colored dot here, I'm actually going to be dropping in a colored uh, texture. That's sort of what it's going to be taking in. Now we can just drop in here in a image texture. Ta-da! So now I can open and pick the location that I have that contains my material. Boop. Let's pop up here a little bit and drop into my paint and I'm going to pick my paint color. Now that is appearing pretty decently here. Uh, you can't really see it super well at the moment, but that's because we don't have any unwraps, particularly on this model. But that's okay, we can fix that. But first, let's start to add everything else on top of this. So, we've got our base color, but we want to add maybe a roughness map as well. So, we can click this, scroll up, because it's got a lot of options in here, and we want to add image texture again. We want to open that up, same location as before paint, and we want roughness. So that'll give us sort of the roughness texture that's located in this. Next, we want to add our normal map. So this one's going to be a little bit different from the other ones, because what we actually want here is our, doo -doo -doo, I've got to find it in this case, because I always forget where it is in this setup. I want normal map. Pop, pop, pop. Click that. It's going to allow us to use normal map settings the color that's going to be applied right here. So this opens up normal map, color, image texture. This one we can open. Again, same location. Normal map, oops, uh, wrong location. So I can just click this little button here, which is going to allow me to change what that's going to be. Paint, and I can go in here into my normal. So now I've got a normal map associated with this, but there's one more change I need to do, which is change this to raw setting as opposed to sRGB. That fixes the math on it and makes this work correctly. So that's pretty decent. But again, I do not have a proper unwrap for it, which is not exactly ideal. So how do we fix this? Well, we can start editing our UVs. Now that we've got a model set up, now we've got everything technically working, let's use UVs. So that's what we'll do in this next part. All right, so 
let's do some unwrapping of UVs. So Blender has a setup for doing uh, unwraps in UVs that can be kind of unintuitive and uh, is hit or miss depending on who you talk to. Um, I find it to be a little cumbersome in some spots, but, but fundamentally can work really nicely, but is a bit baffling. So let's click our UV editing area here. This is one of the easiest areas to work with by just clicking up here. It gives you the interface that's going to work best for working with this. Let's pull this over here again. Now, we can see we've got our model over here. And we can select the whole model, and then that mesh will show up here. Now, you'll notice uh, there is kind of already an unwrap here. Uh, Blender is pretty good at most of the things that you're doing when you're editing. It'll maintain some form of reasonable unwrap for you. However, the default setup might not always work for you. You can view whatever kind of textures you want in here uh, just by sort of swapping between all of the available textures. These textures are coming from whatever has been used in your scene on your various models, so or your various materials rather. And in this case, this will all work fine for me being able to see what my level of detail is like. Now up here, if I hold uh, Alt and Middle Mouse Drag, I can sort of scroll through here, same through this. Uh, because everything's scaled up, I actually can't see everything so easily. On most monitors, you, you should be fine. But again, I'll just view my texture in here a little bit more visibly, or I could switch to texture mode in here, and it'll show me whatever texture is present over here. Uh, but let's go with this mode, because I think it'll help me see things a little bit more clearly. Now you can see here, there's a, a fair bit of stretching going on, uh, and, and a lot of it is, is something that I don't really want. So what I can do is just right click and say, unwrap. Now in this case, I'm not really getting anything good, uh, which is where some of this interface can start to be kind of goofy, kind of fuzzy and odd. Uh, but I can press one, two, three to sort of switch between my uh, objects and, and things like that. But it's still not really, really quite what I want. So what I can do in here is under UV, I should be able to say reset, which will give me sort of the default unwrap. And then I can say unwrap in here. Now, again, it's not really giving me what I want, uh, which ends up being an unexpected and, and kind of frustrating way for this interface to work. Uh, for example, if I press unwrap over here, it doesn't really work, but I could also press smart UV project. Now, the thing that you'll notice is smart UV project doesn't exactly exist over here. This is one of the reasons why I find Blender's unwrapping to be particularly frustrating and confusing because certain things don't exist in both and it can be very, very confusing and confounding and annoying to find. I am mixed on Blender's unwrapping overall because it's more baffling than almost anything else. Once you understand what it's doing, it can be pretty great, but uh, yeah. Um, but for now, let's say Smart UV Project. This gives us sort of most of our abilities for, for projecting and creating UVs. Um, let's go with the defaults for now. Hey, that's not too bad. Um, so we can see in here, things are looking a little bit nicer than they were otherwise. We're probably going to have some seams and things like that in here, and we could fix those. We just got to select everything uh, if we want to be able to see what we're working with, or we can turn on what's called sync mode. So UV sync selection means this is going to be more akin to what you're used to in Maya or Max uh, for being able to select a piece of geometry and have it sync over here and, and sort of match up nicely. Uh, but what I can do is double click an edge, and you'll see it's sort of sister edge or, or uh, sort of sibling edge show up. So that means the two edges are connected. I can right click and I can say stitch, pop, and that will stitch those pieces together. And that's all uh, pretty decent. I can do most of the stuff that I'm used to in a piece of software like this. And uh, it, it's going to work pretty similar to what I'm used to in most uh, applications. Now I can also select most of these edges and uh, start to get certain things working decently, but stuff like this starts to break down where I, I'm trying to select one edge and break things apart, but they're not breaking apart here because the selections are synced. So then I technically need to select this geometry here without synced mode turned on, and then I can select just the UV edges. So when it's synced, I am selecting things connected together based on the model and the UVs. When I'm selecting in the UV area without sync turned on, I'm selecting purely UVs. 
that's kind of the distinction between the two. So for example, here, I could scale this down now, press zero, and sort of flatten that out and, uh, and start to keep everything flattened and align everything more. But for now, we're not gonna go into complex stuff. We're just gonna look at the default kinds of setups that we can use in here to stitch things together. We could use things like welds um, based on distances uh, if we want to merge by distance and increase that distance or decrease it, we can do that in here. But for the most part, this will give us an unwrap that isn't totally busted and give us something to work with. So we can do the same thing in here. Uh, let's select, go ahead and select everything. And you know what? Let's do the same as we were doing before. Let's just do Smart UV Project and work with something like this. Now, if I wanted to, I could select this geometry and say Cylinder Project. Now, its basic cylinder projection is not one that I love. I could align it to object, and that works quite a bit better, uh, but that these back faces don't uh, end up turning out super well, but that's okay. I can sort of separate them out as I need to uh, by, there we go, selecting that part and kind of pulling these off and selecting both of those. And I could just do unwrap as well, or even unwrap in here, and that should fix those. There we go. Perfect. So most of this stuff could also be packed together with the pack options, which actually works pretty decently. And you'll start to see some decent results here. Now, this piece, I think, could certainly be scaled up. So I am going to say, based on UVs, as I select linked all, which will only select this section, based on the linked, and I can scale this up, possibly even scale this down. Now, one thing I'm gonna do here as well is turn off these options, because in this case, I kind of just want to see how everything is gonna look in here without all this other stuff showing up. So this way, I can start to sort of move things around, get the scaling and detail of my textures working a little bit better here than what I had before. Now, let's turn this back on. Let's select this part, and let's make sure that everything is working the way that it should. So let's increase the scale of my selection. Let's make sure that this back face is not uh, being selected, but I think it is. Yeah, deselect that, deselect this. Select this piece here, it's all decent enough. And what we could do to make this a little bit easier for myself is say unwrap, and you'll notice that it kind of works like this, but it's not quite right. I would like to add a seam somewhere. I would like this to like flatten out. So how do I make that work? Well, if I select this edge and I right click and I say mark seam, Marking a seam when I'm dealing with unwraps will allow me to tell un uh, Blender to split that part up when it does the unwrap operation. So let's select this whole thing. Now that I've created a seam, when I unwrap, it unwraps in this manner, which is pretty decent, but it's still kind of curved. I don't necessarily love that. Um, it'd be nice to have it flatten out a little bit more. And this is some of the stuff that I don't like in Blender, where it becomes harder to work with things like this. Uh, now there is a function here uh, called, let's just turn that part off, and then I select this. This, again, this is the stuff where it gets kind of fiddly to work inside uh, Blender's Unwraps, but there are tools to make this easier. Uh, one I recommend is Text Tools, T-E-X-T-O-O-L-S. Uh, it's really great. It, it, it helps resolve some of the interface problems that exist here. But uh, for example, if I select this edge and I wanted to sort of flatten it, I can straighten on x-axis or straighten on y or align on x rather, align on y. Uh, and let's pick this piece of geometry, align on x, pick this one, align on x, align on y. And what I can do is select everything else, make sure that this is my active object. And technically I could say follow active quads. And what that does is it takes my straightened object and makes everything else sort of match that straightening, which is really helpful for this kind of piece. It, it straightens everything else out and keeps the orientation working nicely and the proportion of everything still works fine.
So it's not perfect. <laughs> it's got some goofy ways of working, but there's a bunch of parts that work pretty decently. Um, so it depends on uh, what you're doing exactly on how much you're going to like it, but there's some pretty decent things we can do inside Blender to get unwraps working. Maybe somewhat the way you'd expect, maybe not, uh, but it's it's overall, it's it's not too bad. And I will say that in a lot of cases, the unwrap function, when it does what it's supposed to do, works pretty decent, uh, especially when you set up proper edges. So for example, in here, let's just take this whole thing, let's unwrap it, or actually let's, uh, let's just reset its unwrap in here. Boop. And let's choose the edges that we want to be seams. So I'm going to go ahead and choose these back edges, I think. I think I think that'll be okay. And this one at the bottom. So I can just say mark seam. And I could do this in any order that I want at any time. Uh, but now, when I select all of this and I say unwrap, this is the kind of unwrap that I get. And that works pretty decent. I could, of course, start breaking things up as I need to. Uh, let's say I increase from there. Let's turn off sync, actually. It always becomes a little bit confusing when you're doing this because now I'm in non-sync mode, which is purely uh, editing UVs. So we can see in here, I could grab this and I could break it off. Uh, the way to do that is in UVs, split, selection, pull that off and do whatever I need. So I can scale this stuff up, split, selection. And again, any of this stuff, if you're like, oh, where is it? Right click, uh, I could add it to my uh, shortcuts here so that I've got a break off here or make it a shortcut, anything that I want to do. So all of this stuff becomes available as you want to work with it. However you want to work with it uh, becomes your choice. Uh, so yeah, so that's kind of some of the things that you can do when you're working with some of these pieces here in the unwraps. Um, I find the interface finicky and awkward to work with, but it gets you the job most of the time. Um, and you can kind of eyeball things as you go to see what's really going to work for you. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, there we go. Again, there's tools that's going to make this work a little bit easier most of the time, but you can figure out how to work with it once you've got it set up properly. Uh, in this case, I'm going to take both of these pieces. I'm going to mark a seam. I'm going to select all of it and unwrap and have something a little bit more manageable to work with here. Uh, this part, again, I'm also going to unwrap and add a seam, let's say, right here. Boop. Unwrap. And it does do a nice job of, like, if it can, it's going to unwrap pretty evenly and keep the lines pretty straight. And if it doesn't, you can select one edge and align by Y. Yeah. I guess Align Auto will also do a decent job technically. There you go. And of course, if I wanted to do it across multiple objects, I absolutely can. It's just going to start overlapping and looking kind of wacky. But that's how we can start editing our UVs and getting things to uh, have a, a proper setup for us. Then we can go back in here and start maybe going into our you know, proper shading mode, see how things look start putting some lights in our scene and making it look the way that we want. This is not the prettiest object that we've ever seen, but it does get us a further proportion along the way to starting to make this look decent and understanding how we are meant to be working inside Blender and editing things and moving things around. So hopefully this helps you jump into Blender, get using it, get kind of seeing how to get your feet wet because I find once you get your feet wet in the program, you're going to be able to start exploring more of the ways things work, how to use some of the particle systems to scatter things across geometry, how to duplicate meshes and name things differently and, and do sorts of all sorts of interesting stuff that I really like to do here, um, but can be really intimidating when you're first jumping in and you don't know how anything works and it all seems kind of confusing and fuzzy and weird. Hopefully this helps. Hopefully this gets you working fast and iteratively and quickly in Blender and enjoying it. Like and subscribe and comment. I, I don't know how you end these things. Well, do, do any one of those things.
See you later.